The uh, Committee on Homeland Security will come to order. The committee is meeting today for the first in a series of hearings examining the Boston bombings of April 15th, 2013. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. The attacks in Boston shook this nation and brought back memories of that day in September 2001 that changed our lives forever. I'm confident that we will emerge from this tragedy stronger than ever before. Anyone who thinks they can execute an attack on this country and change our way of life greatly underestimates our spirit and our resolve. It is the responsibility of this committee to provide oversight and investigate what happened, what went wrong, and what we can do to better protect American lives. The victims and their families deserve no less. We will never forget April the 15th, but we must do more than remember. We must hold accountable those who did us harm, as well as the terrorists who inspired them. We must also demand more than just answers for any mistakes that were made. We must find solutions so that it does not happen again. In the chaos following the blast, the American people, including myself, were amazed at the courage of first responders and civilians who ran towards the explosion instead of running away. These men and women motivate us all to pick up the pieces and to move forward. <clears throat> Commissioner, we're so honored and proud to have you here today. We applaud you, as well as the first responders and law enforcement officers who risked their lives to save others. And we owe all of you a debt of gratitude. <clears throat> In order to move forward, today we look back. The families who lost loved ones and the over 260 wounded deserve answers about how this happened and what can be improved in the future. Almost three weeks after the smoke cleared on Boylston Street, many questions remain. What we know today is that radical Islamists still threaten our homeland. And while we don't know if this attack was foreign directed, we certainly know it was foreign inspired. Tamerlan Tsarnaev's trip to the Chechen region, the radical videos proclaiming the caliphate that he posted when he returned, and the types of bombs that he and his younger brother used all signal an Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorist attack. And while mystery continues to surround what happened on the older brother's trip to Dagestan, much can be drawn from what we know about the region. <clears throat> Many Chechen rebels have forged a, a bond with the Al-Qaeda jihadist movement. These lethal warriors have fought side by side with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban against U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. In fact, my constituent son, Marine Sergeant Byron Norwood, was killed by nine Chechen rebels in Iraq. Perhaps most appalling are the suspects reported statements following his capture. These men who hate our values used our freedoms to kill Americans. Since the bombing, questions have been raised about whether the dots were connected before and after the attack. We know that Russian intelligence warned the FBI about Tamerlan and that he may, have tra he, that he may travel outside the United States to meet with extremists. We know he was then investigated and inter interviewed by the FBI. But when he traveled to the Chechen region in 2012, the FBI was unaware. The CIA also received an alert from Russian intelligence, and the agency asked that he be added to a terror watch list. We now know that DHS was alerted to his trip overseas, but nothing was done. In other words, he was on our radar screen, and then he was off. What remains unanswered is whether this information was shared between federal agencies and state and local officials. Almost nine months after Tamerlan returned, 
He and his brother, Jokar, executed the largest terrorist attack on our soil since 9-11. This demonstrates that the radical jihad movement is alive and well around the world and in the homeland. We learned over a decade ago the danger in failing to connect the dots. The cornerstone of the 9-11 Commission report was that agencies had stovepiped intelligence, which pre prevented us from seeing potential terrorist plots. In fact, the DHS was created in the wake of 9-11 to help fix this problem. My fear is that the Boston bombers may have succeeded because our system failed. We can and we must do better. Equally concerning is the emerging narrative which downplays the spread of the global jihadist movement. From the attack at Fort Hood to the tragedy at Benghazi, the Boston bombings are our most recent reminder that we, all must, we must call terrorism really for what it is in order to confront it. You cannot defeat an enemy you refuse to acknowledge. I was disturbed in the days following the attack <clears throat> to read that some officials had closed the case on whether there was a foreign connection when the FBI had just begun its investigation. As a former federal counterterrorism prosecutor, this rush to judgment, in my view, was premature and irresponsible. The American people demand and deserve accountability. And while we investigate what may have gone wrong, we must also pay tribute to what went right. Just as tragedy, tragedy often exposes weaknesses, it also reveals our character. The acts of heroism in Boston and the minutes and days after the attack made us all proud to be Americans. And with that, the chair now recognizes the ranking minority member, Mr. Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding today's hearing. And I want to thank our witnesses for appearing. This hearing has been billed as a first look at Boston Marathon, Marathon bombing. While it's appropriate that we examine the events of April 15th, we need to understand and recognize our limitations. First, we must recognize that the events of the day remain under investigation. While we must fulfill our oversight responsibilities under the Constitution, we must be careful not to jeopardize an ongoing criminal investigation. So we must exercise some discretion in our questioning and our statements about these events, the suspects and theories about links to others who may have not be in custody. Despite these limitations, there's such much that we can discuss regarding the Boston Marathon bombing. We can and should discuss the incredible response from the police, firefighters, and emergency medical personnel. Once again, the first responder community ran toward a catastrophic situation when others were running away. So I want to commend the Boston first responders for their bravery and heroic actions. But I also must recognize that as first responders, they demonstrate that kind of bravery every day. Second, we need to act, acknowledge the people of Boston and the surrounding area. They not only responded with calm and determination on that day, but in the days that followed, they responded to law enforcement's call for help by sharing their photographs and videos, that kind of community spirit, the willingness to pull together and lend a hand is one of the qualities that make this country a great place. Additionally, we must recognize the thoughtful and difficult decision by the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, requiring residents to remain in their homes for a few days after the bombing and placing an entire city on lockdown was not easy. But given that the exact nature of the threat was unknown, it was a decision which had to be made. And finally, we must acknowledge the decision of the Attorney General to immediately refer to the bombing as an act of terror and send the FBI and other federal law enforcement to assist in the effort to locate, arrest, and bring 
to justice those responsible. Mr. Chairman, as we look at the events of April 15th and the days that followed, we must also look at what happened before April 15th. As a Committee on Homeland Security, we must acknowledge that the kind of response that occurred on that day would not have been possible without federal grant funds. The effectiveness of the response executed by the first responders is a direct result of over a decade of investment in preparedness and response capabilities and exercises supported by the Federal Emergency Management Agency and its targeted Homeland Security grants. Since 2002, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the Boston urban area have received over $1.3 billion in funding through federal grant programs. The Commonwealth and the Boston urban area have used these funds to develop the capabilities to prevent, prepare for, mitigate the effect of, respond to, and recover from natural disasters and terrorist attacks like the Boston Marathon bombing. Anyone who has doubts about the value of federal grant dollars should re be reminded of the brave actions of the first responders on April 15th. So as this Congress continues to cut funding for these programs, I hope my colleagues on the other side, who are members of the committee, will oppose these cuts. Refusal to support these funding cuts will be the greatest tribute any of us could make to the people of the Boston area. But Mr. Chairman, I also recognize that in addition to the positive effects of federal grant funding, the Boston bombing also reveals some negatives that we cannot ignore. We cannot ignore that once again, it has taken a tragedy to reveal problems in our vast, varied, and numerous federal databases. We faced a similar problem of a faulty database in the Christmas Day bombing incident. Now we learn that there were database problems which made it possible for one of the bombing suspects to re-enter the country after a trip to Russia. It's time to recognize that we must develop a way to fix and integrate the various databases. We must also realize that in the federal government, no one agency or entity has the responsibility and the authority to scrub and integrate these vast systems that contain records on millions of people. Congress cannot continue to complain about the failure of the databases without giving the authority and the funding to one agency to fix these problems. I guarantee you that if we fail to act, we will be discussing this issue again. But that is not the only issue we must act upon. Mr. Chairman, in response to the events of September 11, Congress enacted the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act of 2002. That measure increased the availability of terrorism risk insurance at the at-risk American businesses by guaranteeing that the government would share some of the losses with private insurers should a terrorist attack occur. That act is set to sunset in 2014. Today, I'm introducing a bill that would not only extend the act, but would add some needed improvements. I urge my colleagues on this committee to co-sponsor this act. We must recognize that small businesses and others that suffer an economic loss due to a terrorist act should not have to shoulder the burden alone and should not have to rely on the kindness of charity. Finally, Mr. Chairman, as we take the first look at the Boston bombing. I hope we do not fall into a pattern of reaching conclusions before all the facts are known. At this point in the investigation, speculation about the motivations of the suspects and the role of external influences seem to change daily. We all want to know the answers and are tempted to reach our own conclusions. But everyone, everywhere I read, the every Thing, there is a time and season. This is not the time and the season has not yet come, but it will arrive shortly. So I look forward to our second look, Mr. Chairman, where we can receive testimony from representatives of the intelligence and investigative agencies that may serve to answer many of our questions about motivations, the suspect, and, ex and external influences. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for appearing today. 
and I yield back. I thank the rank ranking member. Let me just say, as a former federal prosecutor, I always reserve judgment until, until all the evidence uh, is in on, on the case. And with respect to grant funding, I, I met with the uh, Boston Fire Commissioner uh, yesterday who told me if it wasn't for the Department of Homeland Security grant funding that helped them with their training exercises and response exercises, uh, that uh, uh, it could have been a different situation and that that helped in saving, I think, many American lives. And so with that, uh, let me just uh, say we're pleased to have the witnesses here today on this important topic. Uh, first uh, witness, uh, no stranger to the Congress, uh, our friend and colleague, uh, Senator Joseph Lieberman. Uh, we all know represent the state of Connecticut uh, with, with uh, very distinguished uh, in a way in the United States Senate from 1989 to 2013. Uh, in the months after September the 11th, he led the fight to create the Department of Homeland Security, which led to the creation of this committee and the Senate Homeland Security Committee, uh, which he chaired until his retirement uh, from the Congress earlier uh, this year. Uh, with that, I thought it would be appropriate uh, for my fellow colleague uh, and friend uh, from the Boston area. He has one of the best districts probably in the country, but the Boston area, and he has, uh, also represents uh, Watertown. Uh, and uh, I thought it would be appropriate uh, for him to uh, introduce the, uh, the police commissioner uh, and Mr. Schwartz. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I've been in Watertown. Most of the state I have represented at one time or another. But uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ranking member. Uh, I just uh, have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Boston Police Commissioner uh, Ed Davis. Uh, in 2006, Commissioner Davis was appointed by Boston Mayor Tom Menino to be the 40th police commissioner in the city of Boston. In this role, he oversees police services for over a half a million people, along with all those visitors uh, that come into the great city. Mr. Davis, uh, I knew before uh, he was commissioner because of his work uh, in Lowell. He worked uh, with the Lowell Police Department for decades. He also was a leader in uh, using that position to bring different layers of law enforcement and officials together, working in a task force with major cities. Uh, he was the superintendent of the office uh, in Lowell in 1994. And during this period, he was recognized for reducing the crime rate in Lowell quicker than any other superintendent in America with over 100,000 residents. Uh, most recently, Mr. Davis led the police department's response to the Boston Marathon bombings on April 15th. The heroic actions and the quick thinking of the men and women under Mr. Davis's leadership, as well as the National Guard, Fire Department, first responders, and civilians in extraordinary medical community that we have in Boston, uh, led to the survival of 17 critically injured civilians on that fateful day. I also want to note during his uh, leadership that he kept first and foremost uh, in his mind uh, the four victims that lost their lives, uh, Lindsay Liu, Martin Richard, Crystal Campbell, and Sean Collier. Uh, he just demonstrated extraordinary leadership, and I want to thank you for that, Commissioner, and we're pleased to have you here today. Thank you. Another uh, friend of mine, Kurt Schwartz, uh, is the undersecretary uh, in, of the committee in Massachusetts. He's uh, been a person who has just done extraordinary work in so many different regards. Uh, he was an EMT himself, he was a police officer himself, and he's served uh, so many different important positions in Massachusetts at times of crisis and emergency. The Homeland Security Emergency Management in the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security in 2007. He was the leader. He also serves as the director of uh, our MEMA uh, agency, as well as the Homeland Security uh, Advisor for Governor Patrick and the state. He's had a long history of service in the Commonwealth, and, and he's also been undersecretary for law enforcement, fire services uh, under Governor Patrick as well. Further, he's worked for eight years under the uh, Attorney General, where he worked with district attorneys and other law enforcement officials like myself uh, the, for the five years as chief of the Criminal Bureau and the 12 years as assistant district attorney in Middlesex County, he again expanded a resume uh, that's rich and deserved. This doesn't really include uh, the full picture uh, of Kurt Schwartz, 
Uh, he is a man who brought people together. Most recently, Under Secretary Schwartz played a critical role in emergency planning in response to the Boston Marathon attacks. He oversaw and participated in many of the training exercises which aided in the response uh, so successfully on April 15th and further managed Governor Patrick's shelter in place order or the lockdown for the city of Boston. This aided to the successful apprehension of the, of the suspects and also uh, saved possible uh, damage for their other actions that they had contemplated. I want to thank both of these gentlemen for being here. Uh, I've been proud to work with you personally, uh, and you're to be both thanked uh, for what you've done to save lives uh, in this terrible tragedy uh, that hit us in Boston. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Massachusetts. Our final witness is Professor Errol Southers. Mr. Southers is the Associate Director of the National Homeland Security Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of the Terrorism Events at the University of Southern California. Thanks for being here today. And Mr. Southers uh, formerly served as Deputy Director in California, the Office of Homeland Security. The witnesses' full statements will be made in the record. The chair now recognizes Senator Lieberman for his uh, five-minute opening statement. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member uh, Thompson, members of the committee, thanks very much for inviting me uh, to testify and for giving me the honor of doing so alongside Commissioner Davis, uh, Secretary Schwartz, and uh, Professor Struthers. Uh, as the chairman was kind enough to say, after the terrorist attacks on America in 9-11-01, I was privileged to work with colleagues in both houses, both parties, and the executive branch to enact the most comprehensive reforms of our national security <clears throat> system since the beginning of the Cold War in the late 1940s. And that was appropriate because we were, we, as a result of 9-11, uh, entered a new phase of our security history against a very unconventional uh, enemy. I am grateful that the reforms we adopted and the new organizations we created have worked very well to protect the American people from terrorist attacks since 9-11. But as we saw in Boston, they are not perfect. Here's the record in brief. Since 9-11, no terrorist plot planned and launched from abroad against our homeland has succeeded. At least 65 homegrown terrorist plots have been stopped. That's a remarkable record and a tribute to the men and women, civilian and military, public and private, who have devoted their lives to keeping us safe. But the reality is that three terrorist attacks, all homegrown, have succeeded. Carlos Bledsoe, who killed an army recruiter in Little Rock in 2009, Nidal Hassan, who uh, killed 13 at Fort Hood later that same year, and now the Cherneyev brothers who killed four and severely wounded many more in Boston less than a month ago. The Boston attack was in fact the first successful terrorist attack, foreign or homegrown, on civilians, non-military personnel in America since 9-11. Could it have been pre prevented and stopped? Well, from what I know of the facts in Boston, and, and I, uh, or none of us know them all at this point, and from what I've learned <clears throat> over the years about homegrown Islamist terrorism, I believe that though it would not have been easy, it, it was possible to have prevented the terrorist attacks in Boston. In a literal sense, the Homeland Security System we must acknowledge that we built after 9-11 to protect the American people from terrorist attacks failed to stop the Cherneyev brothers. With your help, we must find out why and fix it. I remember a leader in our uh, Homeland Security system nationally who once said to me, the terrorists can keep coming at us and they only have to succeed once. We have to stop them every time, and that's almost impossible, but that's the standard our Homeland Security defenders hold themselves to, and we have to as well. That's why I'm so grateful you've begun this investigation. I think you've got to go back step by step, pull it apart, and ask what more could the public and private uh, individuals involved here have done to prevent this. If I may respectfully offer uh, four brief points of counsel. The first is that in today's political environment, whenever 
there's a governmental failure. There's also the risk that the administration in power will become defensive and not share information, and that Congress will be divided by partisan politics and lose sight of its overriding mission, which of course is to protect the American people from the next planned terrorist attack. I hope and believe that this Congress and this administration will not let that happen this time. Second, the Boston Marathon attacks should again teach us that the enemy we face is violent Islamist extremism, not just Al Qaeda. Osama bin Laden is dead, and the um, remaining leadership of Al Qaeda is on the run, but the ideology of violent Islamist extremism is rapidly spreading. We don't know yet whether the Cherneyev brothers were involved with any foreign group, but we do know that they adopted the outrageously false narrative of violent Islamist extremism, that Islam and America are involved in a struggle to the death with each other. That fact compels us to ask again how this ideology and radicalization to it can be countered and ultimately stopped. The leaders and members of the world's Muslim communities, including our own fellow Americans who are Muslim, probably have the greatest capacity to do the most important work of counter-radicalization, but the rest of us have a responsibility to help. Three, <clears throat> prior to 9-11, Mr. Chairman, as you've said, there was too little sharing of information about terrorist threats among government agencies, and therefore, the so-called dots could not be connected because they weren't even on the same board. Our post-9-11 reforms aim to overcome that serious problem, and to a significant degree, they did. In fact, today, there's so much information being shared on the same metaphorical boards by governmental agencies that the larger problem for our homeland security personnel may be being able to separate the wheat from the chaff, to identify the most important dots on the board so that they can be connected. And that may have been a big part of the problem in the Boston case. I urge you to try to determine whether it was, as well as to ask whether lingering failures to share information, in this case, particularly by the FBI and Department of Homeland Security, made it more difficult to prevent the Boston attack. It may be that the most damaging failure to share information was committed by the Russian intelligence service, whose original inquiries to the FBI and CIA were quite vague, and apparently whose knowledge of what Tamerlan and Charneyev did in Dagestan and Chechnya last year was not really conveyed to our government in any degree until after the Boston Marathon attacks. However, we've still got to ask, and I hope you will, shouldn't the fact that the first notice of Tamerlan Charneyev's possible radicalization came to us from a very uncommon source, Russian intelligence, have marked the case for special handling by our government and guaranteed that this file would not be closed? Were the original FBI interviews of Tamerlan Charneyev adequate to determine whether he was likely to radicalize to violent Islamist extremism? Was the FBI investigation curtailed by existing Attorney General guidelines on su such investigations, which go back to the previous administration? Did the FBI enlist the help of state and local law enforcement, either on or off the Joint Terrorism Task Force in Boston, to continue to watch Tamerlan, engage with his friends, associates, and community leaders, and monitor, monitor his internet activities for the purpose of assessing whether he was radicalizing even further? And why didn't the Department of Homeland Security notify the FBI and the Boston JTTF when its system pinged that Tamerlan Charneyev had returned from Dagestan and Chechnya? And finally, fourth, when it comes to preventing homegrown terrorists from attacking, our homeland, uh, from attacking us, our homeland security agents cannot do it alone. Agencies cannot do it alone. The government needs the help of the American people. If people see something suspicious, they must say something to our government. In this case, there were people who clearly could have prevented the massacre at the marathon by just saying something. Most obvious are the three friends of Jokhar Tamerlan that have been arrested. Certainly they should have told police what they saw and heard instead of allegedly obstructing justice. It's also true that the leaders and members of the Boston Mosque that threw Tamerlan out because of his extreme 
views, could have said something to the police and even done something to counter his radicalization. And even members of the Chernea family, including Tamerlan's wife, could have saved lives, including Tamerlan's, if they had said something or asked someone for help. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, the cost of silence, as we learned again on April 15th, can be enormous, as enormous as the cost of not aggressively carrying out the post-mortem investigations that you in Congress and the American and the administration have now begun. I thank you for that, and I uh, will do anything I can to help you in this investigation, beginning with answering your questions this morning. Well, thank you, Senator. Thank you for your service to our nation, um, national security issues, homeland security issues. Uh, we look forward to working with you. We always open your advice and counsel, and I think you raised uh, some excellent questions and excellent points. Um, uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Commissioner Davis, and uh, again, let me just say that uh, your actions and the people of Boston made us all proud to be Americans. And uh, with that, I recognize you for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It was uh, truly a team effort. Um, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Thompson, distinguished members of the committee, Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss the tragedy that occurred in Boston on Patriot's Day when two cowardly brothers laid siege to one of Massachusetts' most venerated traditions, the Boston Marathon. I'm here as a commissioner of the Boston Police Department, but I also speak on behalf of Mayor Thomas Menino, the Mayor's Emergency Management staff, and law enforcement from across the state and across the nation when I describe our cooperative response to these attacks and what they did to our community. Um, I'd like to uh, point to the four people who were killed in, in this attack. Um, they are indicative of who was there at that event that day. Um, we have eight, <clears throat> we have eight-year-old Martin Richard, who was there with his uh, mother and sister, and um, his father had just run by uh, completing the marathon when the blast went off. Uh, we have a Boston University graduate student, uh, Lou Lindsay. Uh, she was finishing her studies and um, was uh, there with friends um, right next to Martin when, when that bomb went off. Uh, we have a, a restaurant manager, 29-year-old uh, Crystal Campbell, uh, who stood with her friends and, um, and uh, was at the finish line uh, when the uh, first uh, explosion occurred and lost her life there. And um, a few days later, we have Officer Sean Collier, uh, who was sitting in his cruiser uh, in Cambridge uh, when these two brothers uh, came up and, uh, <clears throat> and assassinated him. A young man that had committed his life to law enforcement, a young man that was about to go on the Somerville Police Department. Um, these individuals uh, turned, uh, turned the city upside down. Um, <clears throat> and, and the impact on Boston will last for years. Uh, the Boston Marathon will come back stronger next year, but but it will never happen again without the memory of this, uh, this tragic event. Um, but out of that tragedy and out of that uh, terrible experience uh, comes an enormous amount of strength on the part of the community. Um, it, it was alluded to earlier in, in conversations, but um, the medical people who staffed the tents um, at, the end of the, at the finish line, they were there to treat people with um, with blisters and, and exhaustion. And instead, they, they ended up uh, being thrown into uh, a battlefield scenario uh, with, uh, with in treating injuries that were horrendous. Um, if it wasn't for the actions of my police officers, uh, firefighters, EMS people who responded to the scene, and those medical people from the tents that ran, ran down the street, uh, the death toll would be much higher. And so, that kind of response is indicative of what happened in the city of Boston. Um, I think it underlies this whole conversation about Boston Strong. And it involved um, uh, the BAA, who runs the event. Uh, it, it involved spectators, um, businesses in the downtown area, especially uh, in the Back Bay area, that were shut down for uh, over a week because of the evidence processing that had to happen. Uh, the amount of charitable uh, giving that occurred there, the uh, patience that people had, was spectacular. Um, the cities and residents of Boston, uh, Cambridge, and Watertown uh, cooperated with us uh, when the mayor and the governor made the decision to, uh, to shut the city down. 
Uh, that was the right decision to make based on the information that we had at 3 or 4 o'clock that morning. And, um, and, and the residents um, fully cooperated, which, which was astounding. Um, Boston is a stronger city because of this, and I hope that the people who commit these, these atrocious acts understand that there's a, there, there, there's a futility in their efforts. Um, the city is back on its feet. Uh, we'll never forget the people that, that you see to my left, but I will tell you that um, they had no effect on the city of Boston except to make us a stronger community. One of the things that uh, has been much discussed here uh, is the information sharing that occurred uh, before and after uh, this incident. And um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the cooperation of the FBI, uh, the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, the Massachusetts State Police, um, and, and all of the help that they gave us when this happened. Um, in the seconds after I was notified of this, the very first con phone call I made was to Rick Delorier, the SAC of the FBI in Boston. Um, him and, and Tim Albin, the Colonel of the State Police, were my go-to people because we needed SWAT assets and uh, EOD assets in the downtown, uh, ex expecting that a further incident would, would happen. Uh, they responded immediately and um, gave us all the equipment uh, available in Massachusetts uh, to respond to this thing. They were literally there within 30 minutes. The first victims were, were uh, evacuated within 22 minutes, and within 30 minutes we had every SWAT team uh, in, in, the, in the Commonwealth either on site or on the way to, uh, to Ring Road, uh, which is uh, where we had our, uh, our first meeting and command post. Um, the, the information sharing uh, that we did uh, beforehand to prepare for the marathon uh, was good. Uh, we, we certainly need to look at everything we did, and the Senator's comments are, are, taken, are well taken. Um, uh, everything that we did has to be reviewed so that we make sure that this does not happen again. And we're in the process of doing that. But until all the facts are out on the table, it's hard to say what we could have done differently. But I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with the, with the preparation that we put in place. And after 9-11, I met with Director Mueller uh, from the FBI with several police chiefs just two or three days after the incident. And he committed to including us in the JTTFs, and he's been good to his word. This is not a perfect process. But we are, uh, we are real members of that, of that organization. Uh, I have three detectives and a sergeant that are, that are at the JTTF every day and working very closely with the Bureau. Um, we certainly need to enlist the community better. And um, the points about identifying radical extremism and ferreting that out, the first thing that we need to do is go to the community. We need to explain to the community that they have a responsibility to their community and to their nation and to what's right to report the kind of activity that these brothers were involved in prior to the incident. And, and I think that's the first line of defense. There's going to be a lot of conversation about cameras and, and, and other technical means. There's no technical means that you can point to. There's no computer that's going to spit out a terrorist name. It's, it's the... It's the, it's the um, the community being involved in the conversation and being uh, appropriately um, open to, uh, to communicating with law enforcement when something uh, awry uh, is, is uh, identified. That really needs, needs to happen. Um, and, and so that should be our first step. And, and sh do we have to look at cameras? Sure we do. Do we have to look at more uh, bomb dogs? Do we have to look at, um, at utilizing the assets that the Department of Homeland Security and the, um, and the federal government have provided us? Uh, we do have to do that, and it's really important. The training that, we, that you alluded to, Mr. Chairman, uh, extremely important. It made all the difference in the world in our response here. People are alive today because of Urban Shield and the terrorism training that, that the Department of Homeland Security provided to us. There is no doubt about that, and further investment needs to be made in those things. Moving forward, um, the help of the federal government was critical to our response here. Uh, we need to look at how it happened and why it happened, and we need to do everything we can to prevent it. But the, but the truth of the matter is, nobody bats a thousand. And I think that as a nation we need to come to terms with it and do everything we can to prevent it, but also recognize that fusion centers and intelligence analysis and joint terrorism task forces <laughs> are part of our future. Boston is an international city. 
And we derive an enormous benefit from the people who come to Boston for school and for hospital care and, and, and just to be part of our community. But the, the world is a dangerous place, and I think we need to recognize that and be prepared for it. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Let me just say, um, on behalf of the committee, we uh, thank you for your efforts, your department. Uh, the, our hearts really go out to the uh, victims and their families, both those killed and then the 260 uh, that were wounded on a battlefield, um, many of whom I believe your department and the first responders saved uh, on, on that day. So uh, let me just say thank you for that. And the chair now recognizes the Under Secretary uh, Schwartz for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Thompson, yeah, okay. members of the committee. On behalf of Governor Patrick, I thank you for this opportunity to share thoughts and insights as you take your first look at the tragic events related to the Boston Marathon bombings. The week of April 15 in and around Boston demonstrated the value of our investments of money, time, and resources in our local, state, and federal homeland security enter enterprise. Within seconds of the bomb blast at the finish line of the marathon, an array of personnel, resources, and capabilities, many of which were funded with Homeland Security grant dollars, were brought to bear to triage and care for the wounded, communicate with the public, provide situational awareness for decision makers, ensure the safety and security of the public and critical infrastructure, set up a joint command center, and ultimately identify and apprehend the suspected terrorists. The speed with which Boston, the speed with which Boston responded, supported by the state police, the National Guard, the transit police, and dozens of local, regional, state, and federal law enforcement agencies and other first responders is a testament to the Homeland Security spending and investments in preparedness, training and exercises, effective mutual aid systems, coordinated response systems, and outstanding leadership. I speak with first-hand knowledge of the heroic work done by our public safety team on April 15 and in the following days. I arrived on Boylston Street only minutes after the blast where I joined city and state public safety officials, including Commissioner Davis and Colonel Albin of the Massachusetts State Police. And I was still with this team, privileged to be with this team four days later when the last of the suspected terrorists was captured in Watertown. I commend Governor Patrick and members of his administration, including Secretary of Public Safety Cabral, the State Police, the Transit Police, the National Guard. And I also commend, commend Commissioner Davis, the men and women he commands, and the first responders from the Boston Fire Department and Boston EMS, and the many other local, state, and federal public safety agencies that responded into Boston for their extraordinary performance under horrific circumstances. As you all know, April 15 marked the 117th running of the Boston Marathon, one of the most prestigious marathons in the world. In Massachusetts, quite simply, the marathon is a big deal. And public safety for the, mass for the marathon also is a big, big deal. For local, regional, and state public safety officials, the Boston Marathon is one of our largest annual events, and we appropriately de dedicate substantial planning and operational resources to protect, as best we can, the runners and spectators and the eight cities and towns that host the race. On April 15, public safety, the public safety community was prepared. As it has done in the past, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, MEMA, brought together a multi-agency, multi-discipline team last January that spent three months developing the operational plans, the coordination plans, for this year's marathon. On race day, an 80-person multi-agency coordination center was operational at MEMA. Representatives from Boston's police, fire, and EMS services, and public safety personnel from the other seven cities and towns along the 26-mile course were present in the center, along with key state and federal agencies, such as the Massachusetts State Police, Department of Fire Services, Office of Emergency Medical Services, Public Health, National Guard, the Commonwealth Fusion Center, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, the FAA, the Coast Guard, and our partners, the Boston Athletic Association. And along the 26-mile course, local, regional, and state tactical teams, hazardous materials response teams, 
EOD teams, the National Guard Civil Support Team, Mobile Command Post, and State Police helicopters were deployed as part of an all-hazards operational plan. In short, when the 27,000 runners started the race in Hopkinton, as a community, we were prepared from the starting line to the finish line in Boston. As we well know, at 2.50 p.m. April 15th, two powerful bombs were intentionally de detonated 12 seconds apart on Boylston Street within a short distance of the finish line. The results were catastrophic. Three people killed and over 250 in injured, dozens of them seriously. The response by the public, by bystanders, witnesses, and volunteers in those moments after the blast was nothing short of remarkable. And the public safety response was equally incredible. The response that I witnessed speaks volumes about the investments that we have made in the Commonwealth to enhance our homeland security. From a high-level systemic view, several common themes and key factors stand out as we assess the massive, swift, and effective public safety response to the bombings. There is a clear correlation, as others have said, between the effectiveness of response operations in the aftermath of the bombings and our homeland security investments. The response to the bombings relied heavily on specialized capabilities that have been built and sustained through our homeland security programs. The response to the bombings was augmented through pre-existing inter- and intrastate mutual aid agreements that have been built on regional response strategies and plans. Interoperability was a huge success story. Over the years, the millions of dollars that we have invested under local, regional, and state interoperability plans ensured the responders and command personnel were able to effectively communicate between agencies, between disciplines, and between jurisdictions. We benefited from our history of using pre-planned events like the marathon as real-life opportunities to exercise and utilize our command posts and our emergency operations centers to test our plans and mutual aid systems, to activate our specialized response teams, to stay familiar with the technology systems that we rely on during emergencies, and to strengthen personal and professional relationships amongst people, agencies, disciplines, and jurisdictions that otherwise may not have opportunities to work together. We benefited from our investments in regional exercise programs that allow first responders to hone specialized skills and gain familiarity with responders from other areas who may be called in to support mutual aid, under mutual aid agreements. The cooperation and collaboration across agencies, disciplines, and jurisdictions was immediate and extraordinary. There was unity of focus and unity of purpose at the command level and through the ranks, all the way down to the first responders on Boylston Street on April 15th, and to the 1,000-plus police officers that participated in the state's largest manhunt on April 18 and 19. The relationship between public safety leaders and public officials at all times was open, positive, and constructive. Governor Patrick and Mayor Menino regularly communicated with, in, with each other and consulted with and were briefed by their public safety leaders, such as Commissioner Davis and Colonel Albin of the State Police. Their decisions were informed by and reflected public safety concerns, needs, and objectives, and this fostered constructive decision-making and opportunities for bold, out-of-the-box decisions. The support from the federal government, as you have heard from others, was immediate and effective. Uh, I need to personally thank uh, FEMA, the Department of Homeland Security, the Ex Executive Office of Health and Human Services, um, all of whom were on the ground and with us uh, and uh, supported us throughout this week-long event. And finally, Local and state public safety and emergency management agencies effectively communicated with the public through social media, reverse 911 system, 911 systems, smartphone apps, and for the first time in Massachusetts, we pushed an emergency notification through the new wireless emergency alert service. The response by the public to the bombings and ensuing hunt for the suspected terrorists was nothing short of incredible. On April 15th and in the following days, people did not panic or act out of a sense of anger, 
or frustration. Rather, these tragic and shocking events brought out the best in our communities. They supported our first responders and heeded requests and directions from Governor Patrick and Mayor Menino and public safety leaders, including the unprecedented request on April 19 that residents of Boston, Watertown, and four other surrounding cities remain indoors. The community, as you have heard, has responded to these tragic events with compassion, with strength, and with support for the survivors of the bombings, the families of our victims, our first responders, and the impacted communities. Boston, Watertown, and all of our impacted communities have shown us what it means to be resilient. In the days, weeks, and months ahead, we will conduct a comprehensive local, regional, and state after-action review of the bombings and their aftermath, including our pre-bombing prevention, protection, and mitigation strategies and actions, and our response and recovery efforts. We will engage in this full review not because we have a basis to believe that the system did not work, but because no matter how well it did work, an event of this magnitude and tragedy requires that we gather and analyze all of the facts and determine what worked, what might not have worked, and if there are areas for improvement. And finally, it's important to end by stating that Governor Patrick and I have tremendous pride in our community of public safety professionals who de demonstrated so well its commitment to public safety, even under the most difficult of circumstances. These were trying times, and we are able to look back upon them with admiration for the collaboration and partnerships that truly made a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Under Secretary. And pr please express to the mayor and the governor our appreciation and thanks. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Professor Southers for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Thompson, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to appear to, before you today. It is extremely unfortunate and saddening that our gathering and important conversations were precipitated by the tragic events in Boston, but this hearing and those to follow offer valuable opportunities to discuss the methods and strategies that can best address and disrupt the ever-present threat of terrorism and violent extremism. My deepest condolences, thoughts, and prayers go to the victims of this cowardly act. The Boston Marathon bombing was conducted by terrorists who grew up within miles of where they committed their tragedy. They were locals, educated, living, and working in the area. Because of this, they knew the target environment, did not require training to familiarize themselves with the area and its protective measures. Put simply, the Sanaya brothers were homegrown violent extremists. And because of them, Boston joins a collection of cities around the world that have endured terrorist attacks, plotted and executed by their own residents, even as the extremist ideology to which they ascribed was likely influenced by ideas created and embraced elsewhere in the world. Much like the Madrid train bombings in 2004, as well as the July 2005 bombings in London, the terrorists' familiarity with the target area afforded them critical situational awareness that facilitated their ability to plan and execute a local attack. As a starting point for any analysis on this tragic event, it is essential to explore why and how these incidents happen and available options to reduce the risk of future attacks. In the context of our country, Homegrown Violent Extremism, or HVE, describes terrorist activity or plots targeting the United States or United States assets by American citizens or residents who have embraced their extremist ideology largely within this country. A precursor to HVE is a process of radicalization. Though like the term terrorism, the concept of radicalization is widely referenced but remains poorly defined. The term is not limited to any one racial, religious, or issue-oriented group. Radicalization is a process whereby individuals identify, embrace, and engage in furthering extremist ideologies. The final element, engagement, is one part of the indoctrination pathway continuum which has the potential to yield violent extremist activities. An examination of radicalization yields broad questions regarding how a person becomes engaged, stays engaged, or may actually disengage from a group or extremist ideology. Terrorism requires a combination of three things, an alienated individual, a legitimizing ideology engaged through radicalization, and an enabling environment. Of the three, it is the environment that is most susceptible to positive influences that supported by appropriate policies and behaviors can reduce the risk of homegrown violent extremism. As law enforcement and counterterrorism officials 
analyze the Boston Marathon attacks. We should resist the urge to fix something absent specific evidence or some failure of comp or compromise of the system until all the facts are in. Security is comprised of policies, processes, and technology. As it relates to environments like sporting events or critical infrastructure, the emphasis should be on policies that are risk-based, that is, focused on threats that present the most danger and are most likely to occur. We have the applied research capacity to and do model potential attack paths given a desirability or utility yielded to an adversary. Citizen awareness, actionable intelligence, and interdisciplinary methodologies such as our successful application of game theory randomization around the country, in addition to other new available cutting edge technologies currently being tested in the United States and in Brazil in cooperation with the 2014 World Cup and 2016 Olympics, will continue to hold significant importance for holistic countermeasure strategies. At the same time, recognizing that the, the goal is to contain terrorism, we should seek out and prioritize opportunities to engage communities to take part in disrupting the radicalization process that could ultimately lead to violent action. One challenge in this case is the role of online, the online media can play in fostering violent extremism. Arguably, the Internet's capacity for propelling extremists through the radicalization process is the single most important and dangerous innovation since the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. The Internet, in some ways, is a virtual community, and future attacks against the United States and its interests will likely involve adversaries who have traversed the radicalization process, at least in part, online. Securing a democratic society is a formidable challenge, and we will never be completely free of a terrorist threat. Protecting the country is an ongoing effort that must remain versatile in the face of creative and adaptive adversaries. Every step towards greater security is matched with a would-be terrorist exploitation of an unaddressed vulnerability. There is no finish line in Homeland Security. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, Chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for questions. Uh, Commissioner Davis, uh, first I'd, I'd like to start with you. I, as I said, uh, post-bombing, you know, I, I, uh, the actions of police department and all law enforcement, federal, state, and local was uh, unparalleled. Uh, and um, I, I commend that. Uh, but I'd like to ask you a few questions about before the bombing. Uh, before the bombing, were you aware of the Russian intelligence warning regarding Tamerlan and the fact that he may travel overseas to meet with extremists? We, we have uh, three, uh, three detectives and a sergeant who are assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. One, uh, one of my detectives is actually in the squad uh, that investigated that. Uh, we have access to all the, da the databases, but we were not, in fact, uh, informed of that particular development. So is, is it, it's fair to say that your uh, police officers assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force did not know this information? That's, yeah. that's correct. Would you have liked to have known that information? In hindsight, uh, certainly. Before the bombing, uh, were you aware that based on this Russian intelligence, that the FBI opened an investigation into Tamerlan? We were not aware of that. Would you have liked to have known uh, about that? Yes. Before the bombing, were you aware that Mr. Tamerlan traveled to the Chechen region? No, we were not. Again, would you like to have known that? Yes. Before the bombing, were you told that he posted radical jihadist video websites online? No, Mr. Chairman, we were not aware of, uh, of uh, the two brothers. Uh, we were not aware of uh, Tamerlan's uh, activities. And again, would you like to have known that fact? Yes, sir. We know there was a, a Department of Homeland Security officer in the Joint Terrorism Task Force who was alerted of Mr. Tamerlan's overseas trips, a uh, trip to Russia and the Chechen region. Were you aware of that information before the bombing? I was not. Were, were the officers on the, you assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force aware of this? They tell me they received no word uh, on that individual prior to the bombing. After the bombing, after the bombing, 
Were you made aware of this information? Yes. And, and at what point in time was that? The information started to come in immediately upon uh, our identification of, uh, of Mr. Tamlin, uh, of the, um, uh, the older brother, uh, on the morning of uh, the Watertown arrest. Uh, so the shootout occurred uh, late in the evening on, uh, on uh, Thursday into Friday. And uh, uh, Friday, in the early morning hours, we started to get information about the identity of the individuals. And, and Commissioner Davis, if you'd had this information before the bombing, would you have done, your police force and you, would you have done anything differently? That, that's very hard to say. We would certainly look at the information. We would certainly talk to the individual. Um, from the information I've received, the FBI did that and they closed the case out. Uh, I can't say that I would have come to a different conclusion based upon the information that was known at that particular time. But if there's a, you knew of a Russian intelligence warning that this man was an extremist that may travel overseas, and the fact that he did travel overseas and came back into the United States, would that may not have caused you to give this individual a second look? Absolutely. Under Secretary Schwartz, the Department of Homeland Security funds these fusion centers. Was the fusion center given any of this information that I just asked uh, the commissioner? Uh, like, sorry, like the Boston Police Department, uh, the state police through, its, through the Commonwealth Fusion Center has, I believe, seven troopers assigned on a full-time basis to the JTTF. Uh, my understanding is that at no time prior to the bombings did any member of the Massachusetts State Police or the Fusion Center have any information or knowledge about the Sarnayev brothers. So, this is the whole point of having fusion centers and joint terrorism task forces is to share information and coordinate. I used to work with the joint terrorism task forces, but the idea that, that the Feds have this information, and it's not shared with the state and locals. Defies, you know, why we created the Department of Homeland Security in the first place, uh, and it's very troubling to me. Senator Lieberman, you went through a litany of cases where individuals, Alaki, Bledsoe, uh, the Fort Hood shooting that you did a you know, fantastic investigation. Uh, looking at when, why the dots weren't connected. Um, here we are 12 years later. We put billions of dollars into this. Uh, why are we still having problems connecting the dots? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. L let me first say that the line of questioning that you've just carried out with Commissioner Davis and Secretary Schwartz and their answers are very important. And um, this may be one of the most significant and painful takeaway lessons uh, from the Boston Marathon terrorist attacks, because particularly when you're dealing with homegrown um, radicals, um, the, the community around them is probably going to be your first line of defense. And state and local law enforcement will always have uh, a better knowledge of the neighborhood, of the, of, of the institutions that the people might be involved in. So I'd say that the fact that neither the FBI nor the Department of Homeland Security, in the one case of that Customs and Border Protection uh, agent, uh, didn't uh, notify the local members of the Joint Terrorism Task Force in Boston is really um, a, a, a serious and aggravating omission. And, and so look, you know, as the commissioner said, uh, nobody bats a thousand percent. It's true. And FBI and DHS, I'm, I'm probably one of their biggest uh, fans and admirers in, in, in the country. But uh, here was a case, and they've got to look back at it uh, themselves. Why didn't they involve the local law enforcers who could have stayed on this case and picked up signals from, from the, the, some of the students who, who interacted with them uh, from the people in the mosque who, who threw out Tamerlan because he was such an extremist, um, seen the videos that, that he posted when he came back from Dagestan that could have uh, prevented all this from happening. And uh, so how do you explain it? Uh, you know, people are imperfect, but uh, um, information is being shared in a technological way constantly. A lot of the old stovepipes have come down, but 
In this case, aggravatingly, um, we have two of our great Homeland Security agencies that didn't involve, before the event, the local and state authorities that could have helped us uh, prevent the attack on the marathon. And, and, and in closing, I, I, I completely agree with you, Senator. I, we have stopped so many of these cases, and they're very difficult uh, to stop. And I do applaud you know, the FBI, Joint Terrorism Task Force, Department of Homeland Security, state and locals. Uh, but I'm concerned and, and troubled by the fact that maybe in this case that it wasn't shared even within the federal government jurisdictionally, and it certainly, by the testimony here today, was not shared with the state and locals, which you've, I think, very excellently pointed out, are really the eyes and ears because they're on the ground, and if just maybe someone had looked at him, when he came back, just going up on his, his YouTube website, may have possibly seen that this person had radicalized after he came back from a very dangerous part of the world. Um, and so with that, uh, I now recognize the ranking member. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that a gentleman from Massachusetts, Representative Mark, could be permitted to sit for the purpose of questioning the witnesses at today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Davis, uh, one of the other responsibilities we have as a committee is to, to look at uh, what actually happened. If, in fact, uh, the monies that we have provided uh, to your department uh, were not available uh, and the training that went with the money as well as the equipment, uh, how would you have been able to uh, respond to that situation? Our response would have been uh, much less comprehensive uh, than it was. Uh, we have received, uh, just, just in the area of uh, ordinance disposal, uh, we've received funding uh, to, uh, to put uh, trucks and, uh, and equipment, protective equipment for our offices. Um, Sergeant Chris Conley was, was there. Uh, he had just done something called cut and tags on a bunch of parcels that had been left by people running away from the incident. Um, and, and it was very dangerous work. And I got to talk to him when he was putting his equipment on. Uh, he was clearing literally hundreds of, of, uh, of potential bombs. Uh, very dangerous work that could not have been done safely without the money that we received from the federal government. Uh, the training that we've received uh, has given us an opportunity to test our systems, and we have discovered gaps in radio communications, for instance, that, uh, that, that were closed because of the training. And, and those gaps being closed caused us to be able to communicate with fire and other responding agencies interoperably. Uh, that was not, that was not even, we were not even aware that we had the problem until we did the, uh, the scenario training. So um, the answer to your question is the, uh, the response would have been much less uh, than it was. Thank you. And, and those funds have uh, been an integral part of uh, your department's ability to respond like it has been. And Right. That funding has not only set up response on the street, but it's also put our fusion center uh, called the Boston Regional Intelligence Center. That, that, uh, that operation has been, uh, has been put together with federal funding, funding. It helps us not only with the threat of terrorism, but also with the threat of homicide and other things that we deal with in the urban environment. Uh, that money is critical to our operation of the police department. Thank you. Uh, Professor Southers, you are a former FBI agent. Uh, Commissioner talked about the need to engage uh, immigrant communities, regardless of who they are, uh, in this total process for identifying potential terrorists uh, in our communities. Can you share with me uh, your experience on the community engagement aspect of what we're talking about? Uh, yes, sir, I can. Uh, the Commissioner is absolutely right that with all due respect to intelligence that comes in, the most valuable information that you're going to obtain are from those community members, those family members, in this case perhaps those members of the mosque, who could have shared some information that the Joint Terrorism Task Force could have worked on. 
Uh, we've seen in the past where, in a number of instances, we're working with the community. Uh, although it didn't stop people from leaving this country and engaging elsewhere, we were aware of, in fact, activities that were going on. Uh, to name a few, Adam Gadan, who is with uh, Al Qaeda and still outstanding, possibly in Yemen, was thrown out of the mosque in Orange County, California, but not before the people in the JTTF and the FBI were aware of the fact of what was going on down there. Uh, Samir Khan, and I know that Inspire Magazine has been referred to a number of times since the incident. Samir Khan is an American. He was the editor-in-chief of Inspire Magazine. He was in North Carolina and engaged by his family and members of the mosque, and unfortunately was able to leave the country before that information became known. It would have been very valuable. And then last but not least, Omar Hamami, who's from Alabama, and has left the country, but again was engaged by his family and members of the community about the fact that he was taking on a form of Islam uh, that was not appropriate and is now engaged in al-Shabaab, which is an al-Qaeda affiliate in Somalia. So that kind of information coming from the communities that we need to help us is critical. And it's very important that we don't engage in any activities that would compromise that relationship and in fact uh, stigmatize that community from coming forward to let the appropriate authorities know what was going on. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lehman, good seeing you again. Um, I'm sure that the next life you now serve is a far less stressful one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is uh, one of my uh, former colleagues in the Senate refers to it as the afterlife. <laughs> and, 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 and so it's uh, okay out here, but I hope you and the others will stay here and yeah, do the important you. work you're doing. Um, and I wanted to get your comments. Um, uh, we have invested significant resources in uh, getting communities and states uh, uh, where they can respond as the commissioner said. Uh, but also I've heard you over time express concern uh, that uh, the government's proposal to eliminate grants uh, to state and localities is probably not uh, what we ought to be doing. Can you share that, your, your thoughts on that? Yes, sir. Thanks, uh, Congressman Thompson. Great to be with you again. We're in a war, and um, as I said, it's against an ideology that uh, is not receding. It's, it's spreading, and, and it's taken a, a very uh, uh, difficult turn, which is, as we saw in the Boston case, because um, the only three attacks against America, terrorist attacks that have succeeded since 9-11, are homegrown terrorists. Um, you can't fight this war without resources. I mean, the, the Homeland Security Front is no different than the Department of Defense. And the grants that um, we have created and funded have been critically important in this battle. And again, I come back to the fact that uh, particularly with homegrown terrorists, the state and local law enforcers are in the best position to create the relationships within the communities that will allow them and have allowed them in numerous cases uh, to stop terrorist uh, attacks before they occur. And, and it, they're simply not going to do it without funding. Everybody's, every level of government is pinched. There are a couple of police departments in our country, notably New York and Los Angeles, that spend a lot of money uh, funding uh, counterterrorism programs, and a lot of those programs are outreach to the community. And it's part of the reason why they've been so effective. In a way, part of what we're all saying here, at least I'm saying, is that uh, we, we have to rely more in this phase, new phase of this uh, war with terrorism uh, on the state and locals, and they can't do it without financial help from the federal government. Thank you very much. I yield back. Chair, and I recognize as a former chairman of the committee, Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you for scheduling this hearing. It's absolutely vital, and I commend you for it. Uh, Commissioner Davis, first of all, thank you for your leadership. It was absolutely uh, phenomenal. Uh, let me just ask you, though, from the time of the attack on Monday afternoon, until the shootout early Friday morning. Did the FBI bring to your attention at all the fact that the older brother had been under investigation by the FBI? No, we didn't start to look at that until after the shootout. So this is three and a half days after, and the FBI still did not make you aware of it? That's correct. I, I should stress that there was an ongoing investigation and a lot of information coming in from a lot of different sources. 
But, uh, but the answer to your question is no, we didn't look at the brothers until after the shootout. Uh, after the photos were posted late Thursday afternoon, did anyone from the local mosque come forward to identify either of the brothers? I don't, I, I'm not certain of that. I, I, I don't know of anyone that did, uh, but I know that there was some conversation with, uh, with a group we, that we uh, meet with frequently from the mosques uh, called Bridges, uh, but, but I'm not quite sure what their role was in the conversation. Could you check to, uh, checking back to us on that? Whether or not, cause to me, if their photos were all over television, someone should have recognized them from the mosque. By all means. Uh, also, did, anybody, did any student from UMass Dartmouth come forward to identify the younger brother? They did not. Senator Lieberman, first of all, it's wonderful to see you here today. During the time I was ranking member and chairman, I didn't work more closely with anyone than you. Thank you. Uh, conference committees, legislation, the joint hearing we held on Islamic radical radicalization in the military. I want to thank you for that. Uh, in your statement, though, you must mention any number of times the term violent Islamist ideology, violent Islamist extremism. I have not heard one administration official, including the Attorney General and the President, use the term Islamist. Uh, as Chairman McCall said, uh, how are we going to know the enemy if we don't identify the enemy? Well, I agree with that. Um, look, we know that there are other sources of terrorism than uh, violent Islamist extremism. We know that from the Oklahoma City bombing. We know it from the Unabomber. But um, it was self-evidently and publicly violent Islamist extremism that led uh, to the attacks against us on 9-11-01 and, and didn't take detective work. Osama bin Laden and everybody else declared that to be the purpose. They want to bring down America and our civilization. And, I, you know, it's the old uh, uh, Chinese wisdom uh, millennia ago. You, the first thing you've got to know in war is who your enemy is, and you have to call, call it by its name. Now, I understand the, the sensitivity here, but... Um, I think in some sense it's unfair to the overwhelming majority of Muslims in the world, and particularly our fellow Americans who are Muslim, uh, to leave it unspoken as if somehow they're part of this. It, it's obvious that the, the, the violent Islamist extremists are in a very, very, very small minority of the community. The, the community in America which is the one I can speak about, is, is, as we all know from our friends and neighbors, is law-abiding and patriotic. And I don't think we do any service to them. In some sense, it's almost unfair uh, not to call this by its name. We're all looking for the right words to distinguish this small group of radicals, extremists, terrorists from the great majority of uh, overwhelming majority of Muslims in this uh, country. Uh, and maybe that, maybe we haven't found the right words, but. Um, in this case, what happened, what I gather happened in the mosque in Boston is very instructive. When Tamerlan Cherneyev came back from his trip overseas, he was clearly radicalized, and he began to speak in such an extremist way that I gather the people in the mosque asked him to leave. Well, that, that's representative of, if I can say, the mainstream Muslim community in our country. Senator, I'm running out of time. I'm sorry. One statement I'd like to make for the record, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're talking about the lack of information sharing. I think it's absolutely indefensible that the FBI found out on Sunday that there was a planned attack against Times Square and never notified the NYPD. Here's a city that's been attacked twice, has 16 plots against it, and the FBI refused to give that information to the NYPD. And their reaction when Commissioner Kelly and Mayor Bloomberg and I went public was to criticize us, saying we were somehow compromising the investigation. At the same time, saying the reason they didn't give the information to the NYPD because there was no threat, that it was not a real threat. They can't have it both ways, and the failure to share information is absolutely indefensible, and I think they owe everyone an explanation as to why they withhold information, and to me it fits right into this pattern of keeping it to themselves and not sharing and not attempting to, to uh, stop attacks. I just can't explain it, I can't understand it, and to me it's a severe breakdown in law enforcement. Back. I thank the gentleman. That was, that's certainly something this committee will be looking into. Uh, Chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I find this to be an overwhelming experience to the witnesses. Let me thank you very much to be in this place and to be speaking about an attack on our soil. 
I think it is important as I take a moment just to call the names of Martin, the young, young, youngest of eight years old, and Crystal, and Ms. Lindsay, and Officer Sean Collier. We should always take a moment, just a moment, to recognize them. I want to uh, proceed uh, with uh, first uh, enormous thanks, Commissioner Davis, for the leadership and heroics of everybody in Boston and our first responders. Many of us have worked with officers throughout our professional life. Again, we thank you and we thank the people of Boston and your great state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's kind of you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I want to uh, pursue uh, Senator Lieberman uh, a thorn that um, if you can uh, pursue for me, and we are limited in this time frame, the Russian contact, it still baffles uh, all of us in spite of diplomacy issues, why, if nothing else, that was not a trigger in our various centers, the Joint Terrorism Center, to one probe and to one uh, pursue that information and share it with our local law enforcement. What do you think happened? Uh, Congresswoman Lee, great to see you again. I, I agree with you. Uh, again, as you said, uh, hindsight is always clearer. But um, uh, this was an unusual circumstance for Russian intelligence to notify us about an, an, two Americans, really, that included the mother originally, the Chernev mother, uh, in this case. Now, we understand that we're operating in a context of, of mistrust between U.S. intelligence and uh, Russian intelligence, and yet there is cooperation in some areas. So if, as I look back at this, it seems to me that the fact that this original notification, you kind of look back as you investigate what went wrong, to at what points could somebody have acted to stop this? This, was, this really should have raised it, uh, this case, to a very high profile internally because of where it came from. And now, as I said it in my opening statement, it could be that the most consequential failure to share information was the failure of the Russian intelligence to explain in more detail to us um, why they were interested in uh, Tamerlan Cherneyev. But if, if it had been raised to that level, and that's why I think, I hope you'll go back and, and speak with the FBI and the Attorney General's office, take another look at those Attorney General guidelines to see if in any way they constrain the FBI uh, from acting more aggressively or sharing the information with the state and local law enforcers. Uh, let me ask the chairman, thank you, a unanimous consent to put uh, a number of questions in the record. Without objection. And uh, to put an article from the Washington Post dated today in the record. Let me thank you very much. Let me go to Commissioner Davis and just simply say that this probe has to continue. In, in the uh, course of information coming to you, did the Homeland Security uh, Department provide you with any information about uh, the student visa or the visa of any of the uh, second tier individuals that were arrested earlier than the fact of the bombing that occurred? Did you get any information about there was some concern about the visas dealing with the uh, senior brother and then the others? Uh, we did not. We, uh, we have a Homeland Security uh, analyst in, in our BRIC, uh, the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, uh, but uh, neither the BRIC nor the JTTF. Uh, and and you feel confident you could have acted on that information or at least uh, had a, a structure in your operation that could have looked at that? We certainly have a structure that would have looked at it, yes. Um, and at this point, uh, is there any mass labeling of the Muslim community in Boston? That's always a concern of ours. Um, I've, I've met uh, with members of that community, um, and, and, and they're concerned about it, but there, there have been no incidents reported to me. Professor Souther, what would be the better way of dealing with the vast number of Muslims in this nation that uh, in essence, pay their taxes, serve in the United States military, and call this country a country that they love. How do we work with this community for those 100 percent, 99 percent who want to do well? Congressman, the most important thing we can do right now is to build a bridge instead of a wall. You know, any community or family can facilitate radicalization by inaction, and that is what we don't want at this point. We want an engaged community. We want a community that feels comfortable and confident in sharing information. And as we've seen time and time again, as the Senator alluded to, a number of thwarted plots have come because we've had an engaged community. So at this point, bridges are very important. 
Uh, I, I thank you. And is this a partisan? I think, Senator Lieberman, you made a very good point. So let me just conclude in, on the record um, that this tragedy, as for those of us who started on the Homeland Security Committee and the Select Committee on, on, on Homeland uh, devising this department, this is not a place to raise a partisan divide between Congress and the administration. This is a place to stand against this ever happening again. Professor, would you say that? Absolutely, Congressman. Senator yeah. Lieberman. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. That's most important. Should be unifying, really, because we're all in this together. Absolutely, to save lives. I thank you, and I yield back. Excellent point. Uh, chair now recognizes the vice chair of the uh, committee, uh, Ms. Miller. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, again, we've all said thank you, and we just can't say thank you enough. Uh, our internal, internal gratitude and uh, gratefulness and uh, uh, admiration uh, for the, uh, what all of you have, uh, have done on that terrible, terrible day. And, you know, I was mentioning to the commissioner before we came in here, one of the counties I represent has an annual breakfast where all the first responders, emergency management come. It was last week. We had, I don't know, 700 people. And that was the, almost the entire topic of conversation uh, over in Michigan about what you all did in Boston and how well you reacted and how you responded. And that uh, one of the most uh, heartening things, I think, and anybody that was watching the TVs that uh, didn't have tears in their eyes when they watched all the people on the sidelines as you were exiting the neighborhoods after you caught the, the uh, second murder, uh, applauding, people applauding the first responders. That was a, a remarkable moment, I think, for every American and uh, certainly something that none of us will ever forget. <clears throat> And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Senator Lieberman uh, mentioned when you said the battlefield, you mentioned that uh, Christmas Day bomber. I, I just pick up on that because I'm from Detroit, and uh, we are facing a, a new type of enemy now, something that our country has not faced in the past, uh, who see the battlefield asymmetrically, who see the battlefield in a different way. The battlefield that day uh, was seat 19A of that Northwest flight for that murderer attempted murder, and uh, the battlefield uh, then was the, uh, uh, at the end of the Boston Marathon. And so uh, there's been a lot of talk about information sharing, and, and I'm very appreciative of the uh, questions and the comments about that. But I guess I, my question today would be about how, as we go forward, how we can better um, resource and utilize existing resources for our first responders, uh, not only at 9-11, when we remember it was the first responders who responded, not really the military. Uh, in this case, of course, we had the National Guard that uh, were force, force multiplier for you. And I think as in these days of economic times, perhaps there's a way, and I would ask for some uh, comments on that, how did the National Guard actually meld into uh, your um, what you were doing there. And I'm just I ask that because I'm wondering if there's a way as we are so resourcing the National Guard whose role really has changed uh, and expanded since 9-11. And we all have National Guard units in every state uh, about doing a joint, perhaps joint training exercises with our first responders. Uh, of all kinds of various things that they may be able to utilize that you could utilize uh, as well. I mean, I've got a big National Guard. I'm just outside of Detroit. We have a big National Guard base there, and they're everywhere, really. Um, perhaps this is a way that we could have them share, uh, info, I mean, even though they're under DOD, really, there, I think there's a lot of um, application, uh, things that we are already resourcing through the Department of Defense, through the National Guard, that may have, uh, we could utilize better from training exercises, et cetera, with the first responders. I don't know what you think of that, Commissioner, if you have any comments on that. I don't know what the national standard is, but I, but I can tell you in the city of Boston and throughout Massachusetts, uh, the National Guard has been at the table for all of our training uh, exercises uh, back to just after 9-11. Uh, the, the, one of the big roles that they played immediately after was the CBRN detection and, and, and having uh, uh, units that could come in and monitor uh, to make sure there, was, uh, there were no chemicals or, or other uh, things that we had to be concerned about in the environment. Uh, but the day of the marathon, they were an integral part of our preparation. They had already been deployed prior to the bombing uh, to assist us in our uh, traffic control and, and uh, uh, security operations. Um, so there were uh, several hundred uh, National Guard Guards people uh, at the scene, and the general came right into the command post, one of the first people to arrive. Uh, he was tremendously helpful. Uh, by the end of the day, we had over 1,500 troops uh, available to us. 
assisting our offices in securing, as I described, the most complex crime scene that we'd ever processed in the city of Boston. And, and those, uh, those troops uh, stayed on, on, on the ground uh, for a seven-day period until that, until that scene was, uh, was, uh, was shut down. Uh, but more than just perimeter security, uh, they, they uh, arrived at the scene of the pursuit and uh, brought equipment in. And, and uh, at one point, we needed uh, three of our uh, SWAT teams to deploy uh, out to Dartmouth, Massachusetts. And um, uh, they brought in helicopters to, to make that happen. Uh, Blackhawks came in and, and took the teams out. The state police have helicopters, but they were nowhere, nowhere as, uh, near as large as what we needed to move people around. So. Um, uh, General Rice played a, played a, a very a critical role in, in not only preparation and, and prevention, but also in response after the incident happened. I appreciate that. My time is up. But I, I, I ask that question. I'm so delighted to hear all of that because I, I think that's an area where we can, I think as a Congress, needs to think about melding some of the various things that are happening with the National Guard in response to the, uh, with the first responders, et cetera. As I mean, just in my own area there, on our National Guard base, we actually have the uh, Air and Marine Wing from the Department of Homeland Security with an operational integration center, which all the information is fed by all the affected stakeholders and then used for, principally for border security. But we've used the National Guard along the border, but I just think there's something that the Congress needs to think about uh, more. So I'm uh, very appreciative of your answer. Thanks. And I yield back my time. Thank the, uh, the vice chair. The uh, chair now recognizes a uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to delve quickly into while everything was going on uh, after the explosion. Um, the big picture is it's just an extraordinary coordination. Uh, amazing. All that training, all that effort, uh, and heroism that was involved in that. Uh, but I think we want to look carefully at some of the information sharing even during that period. And you mentioned, Commissioner Davis, that you first learned uh, of the individuals of the terrorists uh, Friday morning. Uh, the, just the senseless killing of uh, Officer Collier. Uh, at that moment, can you share with us who linked that in first to the terrorist attack, how that information was conveyed to you, uh, how soon did were you able to put the identities of these people and connect it to that uh, atrocity uh, as well? Right. I, I, I can certainly speak about the pursuit uh, of, this, uh, of these individuals. Uh, I, I hesitate to get too far into who knew what when as far as the identification because it's part of the ongoing criminal case. But let me, let me, let me do the best I can to, 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 to answer your question. Um, we. Um, we received word of Officer Collier's uh, murder um, within 30 minutes of the incident occurring. Uh, I received a call at my home. From whom? Uh, I received a call from uh, Superintendent Paul Fitzgerald, who was at the FBI command post uh, at that time. Uh, but the, the information that we had received was that it was most likely associated with an armed robbery that had occurred prior. Um, they, 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 did not, they were not establishing a link to our investigation at that point in time. Uh, but we were highly suspicious of it, and, and everybody was concerned about it. Uh, but after uh, a couple of phone calls, uh, uh, we, 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 we sent officers to assist. My chief of the department went to uh, the scene and had a conversation with the lieutenant colonel in charge of investigations for the state police who was running that scene. And the, and the first indications were it's probably not related. Um, but after the, um, the carjacking occurred, um, it was clear that there was something going on. We deployed more officers into the area at that point. And um, um, certainly as soon as uh, the Watertown officer in, engaged the suspect, uh, and, and there were reports of, uh, of firepower and, and bombs being involved. Uh, there was no doubt in our mind. So that's the way the thing progressed. Right. And when you were informed Friday morning uh, about the identities, who conveyed that to you? Uh, the FBI. The FBI uh, teams had been sent to, uh, uh, to process the body, and, and they, were very qu they were very quick to identify who the, uh, who the individual was that was killed in the shootout. Yeah. This is a going on so many levels. The area that uh, I think is worth pursuing, it was mentioned here, is uh, uh, the messages uh, that received from Russia. Uh, and I'm curious, uh, 
about people's thoughts. I don't think there's anyone that would have an answer. Uh, but exactly when the FBI tried to get more information, if they were so interested in this person and they initially informed the FBI, when the FBI tried to get further information from them, they didn't get any, uh, even though they had asked. Uh, and I know there's just such a history of distrust, uh, but there's such an opportunity for mutual benefit in terms of both countries' security in these areas, especially in the Caucasus region. Uh, but it's clear that the insurgents in the Caucasus region now are just not focusing only on Russia, but Western Europe and the U.S. now. So this communication is going to be so important. Uh, either Professor Southers or perhaps Senator Lieberman, you could shed some light on how we can pursue better communications when it's so much in our benefit to do that. Thanks, Congressman. I think you're, you're on to something uh, very important. I mean, look, you, I'm sure you know that uh, particularly, well, in the aftermath of 9-11, a remarkable and very important transformation has occurred in the FBI, which is that it has become a first-rate uh, domestic intelligence counterterrorism agency. And as part of that, uh, offices have been opened around the world uh, including in Moscow uh, as part of the, the, to create the relationships that will lead to information that will enable them to better protect us here at home. Um, but the, uh, and again, this is all part of an ongoing investigation. I urge you to, to bring in the folks from the FBI and, and, and the CIA to talk about this. But from what we know now, the notice uh, from uh, Russian intelligence to the FBI and the CIA was very vague, and of course, most significantly, as, as much as I know now, nothing was shared with us about what the Russian intelligence found out about what Tamerlan Charneyev was doing right. in Dagestan and Chechnya. There are media reports that he was meeting with um, a, a, a leader, a radical leader, et cetera, et cetera. We do know that when he came back, he, he showed uh, great, I mean, much greater signs of overt extremism, as in uh, the mosque, which pushed him out. So, um, you know, President Putin made a statement uh, uh, along, I believe, with President Obama, maybe it was with Secretary Kerry when he was there, that um, we have a common enemy here. That's true. And uh, we should be working together better. And that's true. But um, that didn't happen in this case, and that was very uh, consequential. Yeah, quick question, if I could, Mr. Chairman, to Commissioner Davis or, or uh, Under Secretary uh, Schwartz. In New York, they have uh, camera systems that are all synchronized and coordinated. Uh, is that unique to New York? Is that a pilot? Or they're trying to make the cameras that are there more efficient because of the coordination. I don't know how familiar you are. We had a witness last week uh, from New York talking about that. Uh, could that be helpful in other cities? Um, it, it's certainly not unique to New York. Um, when we look across Massachusetts and our investment of Homeland Security grant dollars, uh, whether it's UAC dollars, state Homeland Security grant dollars, transit grant dollars, um, we certainly have a history of investing um, in uh, cameras, video surveillance, um, I have visited the BRIC, which uh, has a, a quite complex, sophisticated uh, system that, uh, uh, within the city of Boston. Um, uh, we also have capabilities, for example, in the State Emergency Operations Center to, to tie into uh, transit system cameras, highway system cameras. And, and I think in the days, weeks, months ahead, as we, we begin to process what we've been through and think about how we're going to deal with security around uh, events in the future, we'll have to spend more time looking at and probably investing in, not just in the cameras, but what we really need to also focus in is the analysis capability, the technology behind the cameras. Um, uh, civil liberties always uh, also uh, being important, we have to, we have to balance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank each of the distinguished panelists. Let me uh, start first, and uh, Secretary Schwartz, uh, Commissioner Davis, uh, thank you for your great service, and obviously the, the worst of circumstances uh, also give an opportunity to have people seen at their best, and I think Boston uh, presented the best of what America is all about. I also think a theme of communication has come through here. I want to credit you with an important thing during the process. The ability for your entire group to communicate and regularly through the media, but that created a sense of cohesion and an ability for America to follow on during a very difficult time. I think that was a critical thing. The second factor you've noted in your written testimony, the ability to communicate among each other which included as well the ability of, a, of a, a, a separate capacity for law enforcement across jurisdictions. It's a great story of steps that have been done. The last thing, however, is you've, we've talked about communications you did not receive from the FBI or other words, and I know nobody wants to go through this event, but you did. And the after action report, the analysis, You'll watch the films, and it'll be one of the places we can learn. And so we encourage you to be critical as you go through that process and help us all learn together. But I congratulate you on the wonderful work. Uh, the issue of communication is, is an aspect of this and, and how people are doing it today. One of the things that bothers me is uh, Tamerlan Sarnev is identified as having uh, watched online videos of Anwar al uh, We're seeing a, a bit more of that. We looked at hearings about people who did this. Senator, you've been discussing the idea that it's the ideology that is something we are focused on. Who has the responsibility to identify places where the ideology is being centralized and it's serving as the place that people are gravitating to? Is it internet companies? Is it law enforcement? How do we look at that location as the place upon which we can monitor and what's the appropriate level of monitoring? Well, again, a very important question, not an easy one to answer. I mean, I can tell you, as you probably know, that there's a lot of monitoring going on now um, by American uh, law enforcement agencies of um, um, violent or jihadist websites, of chat rooms, et cetera. And, and that's really been uh, important. Um, it's very hard to control, for instance, the, the uh, uploading of uh, uh, violent uh, YouTube sites. I mean, in this case, uh, Tamerlan Chernev, as we know, started a YouTube channel of his own in which he was putting on um, um, Olaki and other uh, violent Islamist extremist advocates. I forgot the number, but t tens of thousands of such channels go up every hour uh, on, on uh, YouTube uh, for a period of time. And uh, Google YouTube has community standards, which are quite admirable, because they can't pre-screen everything that goes up. Um, for a period of time, I had somebody on my Senate Homeland Security staff who was trying to follow these websites, and when he'd see one that was violent, he'd notify, he'd make a complaint to, to YouTube. They'd submit it to a board, and they pulled a lot of them down. Um, in this case, so it's very hard to do this, so I, I'm, I don't want to go on too long and take your time. I say two things. Um, in this case, uh, what I, I'm agitated by, for all the reasons we've talked about, is why nobody was particularly looking for the name Tamerlan Charneyev. Yeah. Uh, by the time he came back from uh, Chechnya, Dagestan, and put up that channel of his, uh, somebody should have been on him. The second and the most important responders to this ideology are people within uh, the Muslim community. And again, they obviously are the great majority, uh, overwhelming, that don't accept this ideology. The rest of us can try by our outreach and by our advocacy to confront the ideology. But they're, they're our allies. The Muslim American community is probably our, one of our greatest allies in this effort to stop the ideology. It's not as easy as stopping an enemy. F forgive me, but as, as, as thrilled as I was when we took down Osama bin Laden, and as hard as that was, it, there, he, that was a direct target. Um, it's, it's a lot harder 
uh, to, to confront an ideology and to overwhelm it. How do we connect the guidelines? I mean, do we have to change Department of Justice guidelines with respect to how far they can continue to hold investigations open? And do we go back and revisit whether or not people have visited these kinds of jihadist websites once we have had some kind of a, you know, a, a predisposition when there's already been a report, as you said. I mean, where do we start to... I'm disturbed that the FBI would have had information which we've already identified, which made him a suspect, or at least a person of concern. They closed the book, but subsequently we discovered what you've just talked about, which is his participation in the violent jihadist websites. Well, I don't have an easy, a quick answer to that question, but I'll tell you, I've learned enough from this case, and I appreciate your question, to feel very strongly that this committee, that the administration, the Department of Justice, have to review the, attor the existing attorney general guidelines for investigations by the FBI, and most importantly and directly, to determine whether those guidelines constrain the FBI to stop prematurely, as we look back now, stop the investigation of Tamerl and Char Charnayev after they were notified by the Russians. And did they in any way um, send a message to the FBI agents that they shouldn't share this information with the local law enforcement until they had a greater level of proof uh, that a crime was about to be committed. That's a very high standard. It's so high that it probably won't allow law enforcement to act before the crime, or in this case, the terrorist attack occurs. Well, thank you, Senator. My time has uh, expired, but Mr. Chairman, I do hope that's an issue that we can use as a stepping off point. For the Excellent point. Uh, you being a former U.S. attorney, me a federal prosecutor, I think these AG guidelines need to be looked at. and. Uh, uh, with that, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Commissioner Davis, I also want to thank you and through you, the, uh, the first responders who uh, responded so heroically and capably after the, the attacks. Um, really appreciate that. And uh, I also want to tell you that I appreciate your comments about um, the difficulty in balancing uh, greater scrutiny uh, with the community policing that you must do in order to be successful. And um, like you, uh, I, I live in an inter international community in El Paso, Texas, um, one whose success is predicated on our relationship with Mexico, on our uh, ability to welcome immigrants. And I think our uh, chief of police and our sheriff in El Paso would agree with me in saying that we have routinely been named one of the safest, if not the safest cities uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, in large part because of our immigrant community and not despite it. And uh, following on the, on the chairman's remarks about uh, terrorists who would seek to force us to change our way of life, in, in El Paso our way of life has already been changed following uh, this Boston attack. You know, now uh, students uh, who are coming across our international bridges to attend school at the University of Texas at El Paso are undergoing secondary inspection. Uh, we received calls yesterday, some are being detained up to eight hours as they try to reconcile data uh, between uh, that shown on uh, their visas and those in the computer systems uh, that CBP is, is using. Um, how, as, as someone who has this responsibility, what advice do you have for cities like ours to uh, enable positive relations with the large immigrant communities there so that immigrants and their families feel comfortable coming to you with information that will help you in enforcing the law and keeping those communities safe and at the same time balance the need for greater scrutiny uh, and uh, vigilance in ensuring that something like this doesn't happen again. That is, that is a, uh, a, a great question it's in, in the, and there's a complex answer to it. Uh, it starts off with developing relationships in immigrant communities, uh, something that we have paid particular attention to in Boston over the last 10 years, 20, 15 years since community policing has been put into place. Um, we do outreach uh, in, uh, uh, in minority communities by doing uh, community policing training uh, in, in, uh, in Spanish. Uh, you know, we, we, we try to 
we try to uh, do specific outreach uh, to, the, to the Latino community uh, because there's been such an influx in, in, in some of our neighborhoods. Um, those, I go to those classes and, and I, I, I listen in and, and uh, I, I have an opportunity to talk to people who have newly immigrated to the United States. And they're incredibly uh, thankful for the work that we're doing in outreach to them. And we have developed um, information, not because, uh, not through infiltration, but through appealing to their sense of community and nation. And, and I think that that's the answer to, to, to this in a large part. You, you need to, you can't develop a relationship with someone in a crisis. It has to be developed before the crisis. And so there, there has to be real attention paid to who's in our community and what are we doing to talk to them. We do that through outreach classes, but we're also having great luck with social media recently. And, and, and so the whole use of social media as a, as a dialogue, not, not just a, a loudspeaker, but a, but a dialogue, dialogue between the police and the community, that plays an important role in, in our ability to, to do outreach to people. And as it, as it relates to, to stops at the border, um, it, it's really important that the bureaucracy doesn't guide the whole interaction, that there's some human interaction there and some logic to those communications that happen at, at the border. And I, I think that's the key to it. The horror stories that we hear are, are usually a result of someone following a script that has, that, that has rules and regulations but no logic to it. And I, and I think there's a combination of both that needs to happen. But again, we're, 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 we're shooting for perfection and it's difficult to achieve. Yeah, as, as you said earlier, uh, no one bats a thousand. Uh, and I'm, I'm concerned that we not overreact, and as Professor Southers said, that we not try to fix something uh, before all of the facts are in, or in fact we run the risk of changing our way of life and inadvertently compromising our ability to gain intelligence uh, and to gain the cooperation of these immigrant communities. And I want to make sure as someone who represents one of the largest immigrant communities in the United States, that that is not what we do going forward, because it will, again, inadvertently compromise our ability to make our communities uh, safer. So, again, I appreciate your, your answers, your comments, and uh, the work that you and the, the people that you represent have done to, to make this country safer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I want to advise members, votes have been called. We have about uh, six and a half minutes. I'm going to allow uh, Mr. Duncan uh, to ask his line of questioning, and then we will uh, as I understand recess, I understand the witnesses are uh, willing to remain available. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be back after votes around 1135. With that, uh, Mr. Duncan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to start off by saying that I believe that uh, the former chairman of the committee, Peter King, uh, needs an apology from mainstream media. Um, he was vilified and demonized for holding radicalization hearings, and we saw just uh, radicalization of Muslim youths happen with regard to, to Boston. And so um, that just want to throw that out there. I appreciate uh, Chairman King's leadership as, as well as yours on this issue. Um, multiple conflicting reports indicate that Tamerlan may have been listed in one or more federal terrorist databases. Uh, we know the FBI's tied uh, database, but uh, he possibly had a terrorist watch list or a terrorist screening database, T TSDB, and possibly a uh, Treasury Enforcement Communication System or TEX file. So multiple different uh, hits in different databases that may have uh, alerted someone in law enforcement that he was uh, a danger. And the federal government has known about information sharing challenges for years, and we talked about this in the last Congress and kind of pursuing some of that in this Congress about IT systems and communications and information sharing and cross-referencing. And um, I can do a Google search on Senator Lieberman and find out a lot. Because these search engines are able to, on the private sector, able to uh, interact and, and share and cross-reference that type of information. Since 2005, the GAO has sounded alarms about terrorist-related information sharing by placing it on its high-risk list. According to GAO, the federal government has made no substantial progress in developing a system to strengthen the sharing of intelligence, terrorism, law enforcement, and other information among all of its stakeholders, including federal, state, and local, tribal, international, and private sector uh, partners. And we just heard that the local and uh, state law enforcement, as part of the JTTF, were not notified of information that uh, the feds may have. So 
Yeah, we're struggling to connect the dots with regard to uh, the cross-referencing or information sharing. So yeah, if the dots had formed a picture or the intelligence had been shared more effectively, Commissioner, do you believe we could have prevented the attack? It, it's, it, I, I can't answer that in one word. It's hard, it, I, I think the answer is it's hard to say. Um, someone looked at this initial information and closed the case. So there, there, was a, there was an assessment that there wasn't enough there to do anything more than, than an initial interview. Um, that all has to be reviewed as to what factors occurred during the interview, and I haven't seen that information. Um, there's then other information that's coming in that there were further databases that, that, were, um, that may have had wrong information in them. All of, all of that um, has to be looked at very closely. And I guess in hindsight, if you were to be able to cl connect all the dots on that first, during that first interview, there might have been an open case there that would have that, that would have caused the FBI to brief everyone in the JTTF on it, and 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 we would all know about it, and we'd all make a decision as to what each particular agency wanted to do with that information. But um, but 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 you have to look at the timeline as to who knew what when to make a determination as to whether or not mistakes were made. And, I, and I, I don't have the answers to that right now. So if we knew everything that we know now, uh, absent the, the, the blast, uh, well, before the, without the blast being involved in it, but if we knew all of these things that have come out since then, we would have taken a hard look at these individuals. But, uh, but at this point in time, I can't say that when we knew things that we would have done anything differently. And I, I'm just amazed that um files were actually closed on someone who we were notified by a foreign country that uh, he had may had ties to terrorism and they actually closed the file uh, that you know his name wasn't put into a system and once we realized that um, uh, this gentleman may be a well let me back up and say I'm amazed that the American people the general public in Boston had to identify this guy that somebody within the FBI or JTTF didn't go wait a minute that guy looks familiar didn't we investigate him a couple of years ago we had to rely on uh, the folks that within the Boston community to identify him. Um, one thing we've talked about in this committee is the fact that CBP has a system, ICE has a system, FBI has a system, NCTC has a system, and that if you want to research information about certain individuals, you have to go into one system with a separate password. If you want to go into another system, you have to come out, maybe go to a different location, enter uh, in with a new password in a different system, and do this over and over to make sure that uh, you've got the redundancy necessary to find out all the information, whether it's a visa screening or whether it's a, an act of terror or an individual that's suspected. So we need to work um, and I think, Senator Lieberman, this was partly why DHS was set up, so that it would be the hub and the wheel to share all that information so that we wouldn't have the mistakes made that we saw uh, leading up to Boston that we're starting to discover now. So I think this, com this hearing is very timely to raise that awareness within the eyes of the American people that DHS is the hub and the wheel. We spent billions, hundreds of billions of dollars to do this, and I don't believe it's uh, been effective as, as seen by Boston. So. Thank you for y'all's service. Um, Commissioner, uh, God bless you. you. And God bless all the first responders. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Let me thank the witness, uh, witnesses for their patience. We stand in recess, subject to the call of the chair. We'll reconvene, reconvene 10 minutes after the conclusion of the votes, about 1135. Thank you. There's a series of votes on the House floor, so the Homeland Security Committee is taking a break in their hearing looking at the Boston Marathon bombings. Public safety and security in Massachusetts will take you back live now to the hearing room. The House Homeland Security Committee hearing again this morning testimony on the Boston Marathon bombings. We expect the committee to gavel back in shortly. Live coverage here on C-SPAN.
The uh, committee will uh, resume, and I want to thank the witnesses for uh, their patience and sticking around during votes. I know it's, uh, it was long, and, uh, but I do want to proceed with this uh, hearing so we can let you go. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that <clears throat> uh, now I know what all those witnesses were going through for all those years that <laughs> we adjourned to go and vote. <laughs> uh, it's tough being on the, on the other side, isn't it? Uh, it <laughs> Uh, with that, let me go ahead and get uh, started, and Mr. Horsford uh, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you and the ranking member and want to join with your remarks earlier in thanking um, particularly Commissioner Davis uh, for the hard work of the first responders. Uh, you performed uh, exemplary, and it was an example of you know, how we need our first responders uh, to react. And to the entire city of Boston and the Boston Police Department, you know, as the chairman and the ranking members have already said, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, and without a doubt, uh, the rapid response by the Boston's first responders really made a significant difference. I want to point out something in your testimony. Uh, you stated that the federal government provided invaluable assistance both in helping us prepare for and respond to this tragic event. Uh, preparedness training provided through UASI and other federal funding set a framework for multiple jurisdictions to work seamlessly with one another in a highly effective manner. In studies on terrorist targets, uh, the RAND Corporation has stated uh, that Las Vegas, the, the district uh, that I partly represent, stands out in having a high proportion of high likelihood targets compared to the nation as a whole. That the same study also reports that the unique composition of hotels, casinos, and skyscrapers increases the overall attack probability in Las Vegas relative to other cities in the same uh, likelihood tier. Yet, in my home state of Nevada, our Urban Area Security Initiative faces reduced funding because of flaws in the relative risk profile model that has inex inexplicably uh, uh, dropped Las Vegas' ranking as a likely terrorist target. So my question is, have you seen the same reduced level of funding in Boston over the last couple of years? And if so, you know, what has that been and how are you grappling with it? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, Sheriff Gillespie and I have uh, met frequently on this challenge, and um, we traveled to the Middle East this past July and uh, visited uh, police officials in Jordan, uh, in Israel, and uh, in the Palestinian Authority. And uh, we had uh, direct conversations about the threats that they are dealing with and how they respond to them. And, and that just cemented in, in my mind, and, I, and I'm sure in Sheriff Gillespie's mind, uh, the need for us to be prepared. UASI is simply the best vehicle that we have at the local level to make that happen. And um, we have not received significant cutbacks. There have been some cutbacks. Uh, but we were facing the same threat several years ago and overcame it. Um, I can tell you that I'm convinced now, after responding to this incident, that if we had not trained uh, through the UASI process, uh, they funded uh, joint terrorism training uh, preparation and something called Urban Shield. And if it was not for the, uh, th those preparations, there would be more people who have died in these, in these attacks. Uh, it is critical that we maintain that funding to urban areas. Um, this is not a, uh, uh, a frivolous expenditure. It's something that I s have seen work. And it also gives us and we're the people on the ground. We, we know what we don't have, and, and we know what we need to get. And the less bureaucracy around that, the better off for us. And that's what USC has done for us. Thank you, and, and thank you for recognizing Sh Sharon Gillespie. And, and uh, I was meeting with him and our assistant sheriff at our counterterrorism center just last week, uh, where they you know, shared with me the fact that, in our case, we went from a peak of $9 million of, nine, of UEC funding to uh, under $2 million uh, recently. And so, you know, that's a 70 percent reduction in five years. It, it's a, a, a huge impact at a time when the threat appears to be increasing. And so 
what are your recommendations to us as you know, policymakers at the federal level, any of the witnesses on how we need to prioritize uh, you know, these funds in order to support your work as, as first responders or, or other leaders in this regard? Just briefly, I'll, I'll just add to my comments by saying that the, the priorities that uh, you funded work very well for us, and we should continue that. But that added component of giving us the ability to meet with foreign uh, police and military leaders who are dealing with this threat and, and understand what they're going through in their countries. As I said, we're an international city. That, that, that knowledge, uh, I traveled uh, with PERF, Police Executive Research Forum, who funded that. that, uh, that but that, that trip and the, and, the, and the conversation I had with the people in London about the way they responded to the uh, tube bombings drove this investigation. I can't tell you how valuable it, invaluable it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to our witnesses. I know it's a long day for you, but I really appreciate you being here. Uh, I'd like to, at the outset, to recognize uh, there were some victims of the Boston bombing from Charlotte, North Carolina, the Gross family, uh, and just want to, again, reiterate what this committee said before, that our, our thoughts and prayers are with the victims and their families. There are many that are still on a long road to recovery. And we're going to keep their, uh, them in our thoughts and prayers throughout this process. Um, I, I guess I will start with Commissioner Davis. Um, one of my uh, lines of question I'd like to go down it has to do with the type of information sharing when it comes to top secret information. Uh, I assume that you and the Undersecretary have clearance, a certain level of clearance, and, and maybe the folks in the J, uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force have top secret clearance and are able to see the same information uh, DHS and other agencies have, is that correct? That is correct, sir, yes. Do, do you feel like that there's a, that you have an adequate access to that information uh, through the folks in the JTTC and, and your, you and your staff? Yes, I've been assured by the special agents in charge that uh, whenever information comes to their attention that affects my community, that I'll get that information, myself and the mayor as well. Uh, mayor Menino was briefed in on any threat that, that manifests itself. Uh, and that has worked over the years. We've got information for, from them on various things that uh, were evolving. Well, and from your perspective, do you feel like the mechanisms are in place to get top secret information uh, to your, agent, your department through the state agencies, uh, the, the dissemination of information? Do we have the proper mechanisms in place uh, to, to, to get the information you need on threats? The mechanisms are there. Uh, we have uh, top secret and secret computer systems uh, that we have access to in our, uh, in our uh, Boston Regional Intelligence Center. Uh, we have uh, rooms that allow that uh, to happen. Um, we, uh, we frequently talk about issues that, that, uh, that come up. Um, and so I, I think that the mechanisms are in place. Yes, I, I do. Great. Um, well, I guess the other layer of that then would be uh, when you've got this top secret threat information, it's shared from a federal agency to your department, um, but then you've got your patrol officers out there and you want them looking and eyes open. Um, taking that information from top secret level to a, 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 a lower level of secrecy that could be disseminated on the patrol level is that something that, that you're equipped to handle? Is that something uh, that is, is that become an issue? Is, how have you dealt with that in, in the past? Each case is different, Congressman, and, and um, we have had debates as to what goes out and, and when it goes out. Um, and so, we, you know, from my perspective, uh, I err on the side of pushing information out quickly. Uh, th there are always uh, deliberations about that. There are always conversations about what is appropriate to get out uh, to a wider audience. But the protection of my officers and the, pro the protection of my citizens is my driving uh, motivation to get as much information out as quickly as possible. Well, I think that was clearly evidenced in this situation. While the world was watching, uh, you and your department did an exemplary job. Uh, and I, I really appreciate, on behalf of the American people, what you've done. That's uh, very kind of you, sir. Thank you. Well, I guess, I guess my, the essence of my question is, does the Department of Homeland Security need to do more to help you uh, sort of develop the information that, and take it from a top secret level to a, the, 
information that can be disseminated on the patrol level? Uh, do we need to look at ways to do a better job on the federal level to help you um, process or package that information so it can be distributed to your officers? Is, that, is, there, is there a need there for that type of assistance? My belief is that in the 10 years since 9-11, these mechanisms, as you, as you stated, have been put in place and they work uh, well. Uh, however, I think that in this area, like we do in a lot of other areas, there should be a constant process of improvement. We should be always examining what we're doing and moving it to the next level. We have incredible new tools that have just developed in the last few years with computers and communications equipment that have not been factored in appropriately. And, and so let's, let me just say briefly on the, on the radio and communication side of it, okay, so when we talk about street level communication, what I can get out to my offices and who's talking to who, um, we have not moved forward as quickly as we should in, in that particular area, and I think that has to be looked at. But when you start there and you move up the chain as to who talks to who, when, and what information is available, it all has to be examined all the time. I think this incident is going to be a good case study. Well, thank you for your, for your answers, and, and I agree, and I think that this committee's approach should be and, and is to look at lessons learned, look at moving forward, uh, how we can improve, and uh, again, try to be right a thousand percent of the time is, uh, is, is the goal. But thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I, I thank you for that. I, I uh, unfortunately have to step out for a minute, so I'm going to turn the gavel over to a very experienced uh, individual, Mr. Uh, King, who chaired the committee for six years, correct? So, but uh, before I do that, let me just say, Senator, thank you so much for your advice. Council, uh, Under Secretary, Professor, Commissioner Davis, uh, your presence here today is, um, uh, really means a lot to all of us. Um, in your testimony and to the people of Boston, uh, we support you in your efforts. And let me also say thank you to the mayor uh, for allowing you to come here today to appear before this committee. So thank you very much. <laughs> Gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome to our witnesses. I welcome this opportunity to highlight uh, the brave heroes, the citizens of Boston, uh, who ran into the blast zone. Uh, to help the victims affected by the blast, but also to highlight the brave men and women uh, of law enforcement and the emergency responders uh, who uh, hunted, uh, captured, and killed uh, the two individuals responsible for this. Uh, this serving on this committee for me is uh, also special because uh, I was a former prosecutor, but also uh, a, in a congressional intern. Uh, in Washington, D.C. when September 11th happened. And what happened in Boston reminded me that the threats facing our country are still very real. And while there is information to be learned okay. from the intelligence community, okay. community as far as what they knew before the blast went off, uh, it's clear now that we face uh, new emerging threats from lone, radicalized wolves who can use readily accessible materials that you can get off the Internet to wreak havoc uh, and uh, do damage in mass groups. And that's what I think we are here to seek to uh, protect against and talk about uh, today. Uh, but there are a lot of answers to come from the community, but I want to talk about what happened once the blasts went off uh, and what our emergency responders uh, did and examine uh, to what degree we can make sure that you and other agencies uh, are more prepared. I also know uh, that because of the sequester, uh, homeland security funding uh, could be threatened in the future. And we have talked a lot about the Urban Areas Security Initiative. I come from Alameda County, where I was a prosecutor, and it was the Alameda County Sheriff's Office that developed uh, Urban Shield. And they've been doing that for a number of years under the leadership of Sheriff Greg Ahern. And I understand that uh, former Assistant Sheriff uh, Jim Baker actually went out to Boston back in December and uh, led uh, part of the efforts for Boston Urban Shield. So I was hoping you could tell me just a little bit about what lessons were learned in Boston uh, from your Urban Shield program and what would be threatened if you did not have uh, that funding in the future. 
Uh, certainly. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Sheriff Baker and, and, and the other individuals who developed Urban Shield uh, did, did us a, a, an incredible service. Um, we sent teams out uh, to, to Alameda County uh, twice. And uh, after, after the second time, uh, we, we talked about them moving the training to the East Coast uh, for, uh, so that we could incorporate people uh, throughout New England. Um, and, and that's exactly what happened. Um, we've, had, uh, we've had two of these uh, exercises now that uh, have, have allowed us to um, really examine what we would do in, in, the, in the case of a mass casualty event uh, like we saw in Boston. And, um, and, and we included everyone in, the, in this training. It wasn't, it, it, it sort of centered around SWAT teams, but then they brought in <clears throat> hazardous materials teams. Kurt and his team uh, were, were incredibly helpful in making this happen and bringing everybody into the, into the fold on, on, on this whole uh, exercise. Um, one of the things that popped up in, in, in our first exercise was that uh, our communications with the fire department was not sufficient. And so we were able to change our, our radio system uh, to correct that, and, and after the blast happened, that was helpful to us. That interoperability made a difference in our ability to respond to the marathon. And would reduced funding uh, for that program uh, threaten your ability to respond if an attack were to occur again? Without a doubt, with, without question, if funds are cut to these programs, we're not going to know what we don't know. It's only when you exercise these events that you find out that you have a gap in your, in your systems. And, you, and, and if you find that out after um, the incident occurs, um, lives are at stake. And you mentioned that you were able to work, work with international law enforcement agencies. Were you able to work with uh, forces from Israel and anti-terror uh, departments from Israel? Yes. The Israeli... Uh, military and, and police services have been very helpful to us sending people over to, to train us. As a matter of fact, the, the tactic that uh, Sergeant Conley used uh, in, in uh, opening the bags up, uh, the, the cut and tag tactic, w was, uh, was uh, taught to us by the Israelis. And again, uh, Chair, having been here uh, when September 11th happened, I remember how dark of a place uh, Washington became, but I know uh, under your leadership and also uh, Senator Lieberman, uh, under your leadership, uh, we were able to invest uh, in a department in Homeland Security, uh, and I think what we saw after uh, the bombs went off, the coordinated efforts among uh, local, state, and federal law enforcement is what was envisioned uh, as far as uh, how we would respond to an attack. So I want to thank uh, you, Senator, and also uh, you, Chair, for your work in this area. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. A uh, gentleman from Utah, Mr. Stewart, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to uh, the witnesses, thank you for being here today. As with all of us, we are appreciative of that. Uh, a very quick comment or two before I, I get in that. Mr. Lieberman, you mentioned in your opening comments about the need for bipartisanship as we approach, it, approach this. You have been a great example of that through your career, and many of us are grateful for that. Uh, Commissioner Davis, if I were a uh, Hollywood casting director and I needed a strong uh, persona of a leader, I think I would look to someone like you, so thank you for that. Uh, in, in considering this case, I think, uh, I think of us, many of us want to break it down chronologically. Uh, you know, maybe phase one to phase two. Phase one being what happened up till that fateful morning, April 15th. What, uh, what is it that took place prior to the bombing? And then the second phase is what happened subsequent to that. The investigation, the apprehension, you know, the pursuit of the individuals, and then what we're doing now, and that's looking back on lessons learned or what we could have done better. And it seems to me that there were a lot of things in phase one and phase two that were done right. Uh, you know, this wasn't, a, uh, this wasn't a catastrophic failure in the sense that there were many things that were done right, but there were clearly some meaningful failures or we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be having this conversation. And you, when you look at some of the considerations in phase one, you know, how, how were these individuals radicalized? Who assisted them in their radicalization? Who assisted them, in, did anyone assist them in the bombing itself or in preparations for it? Were they receiving logistical or other kinds of support? And did we miss any warning signs? And of course, some of those uh, questions have been discussed this morning and, and, and much more conversation as we go forward. But Mr. Hudson, my friend here, mentioned looking forward, and that's what I'd like to direct now, and that is, I think that we can agree <clears throat> that somewhere in our nation right now, 
there are individuals who would like to do exactly the same thing again. And in fact, they're probably preparing to do that again. Would, would that be uh, you know, outrageous to make that claim or would you agree with that? There's someone out there doing that. We all agree on that. Yes, thank you. And, and knowing that there must be individuals who are in some phase of planning a, a, a similar event, maybe several months away or maybe longer, have we done anything now? Have we looked at lessons learned and said, okay, we need to continue the investigation, we understand that, but have we done or changed anything now in order to make it more difficult or to stop those efforts from going forward? In any of you, I'd love your response Well, I'll response start it briefly. That. Thank, uh, thanks for the question. Actually, I think this committee is doing that now by raising the questions that have been raised today. And to go back to what you were kind enough to say at the beginning, I'm, I'm, I'm really encouraged by what I take to be the totally nonpartisan approach in the committee to finding out what, uh, wrong, what went wrong uh, here. That's, that's the first thing we can do, because you're absolutely right. There's at least one other group of people, and probably more, who are, who are beginning to think about carrying out a terrorist attack against our country. That's been the record of the last 11, uh, 12 years uh, since 9-11. And see, Mr. Lieberman, if I could, I don't mean to disagree with you, because I don't, but if I could just take that a little further. We all want to continue the investigation, but we don't want to wait until the investigation is over to do things that we can do now. And that's my point. There must be something that we've done that said, look, there, this is, there's an immediacy to this. We can't wait for the hearings to conclude. Let's do this now. I'm wondering, can any of you share things saying this is what we've changed in the last three weeks that have made this less likely to happen? If I, if I can offer a couple observations. Um, you are absolutely right, um, starting at the, the local level, regional state, um, Monday evening, April 15th, just hours after the bombing. Um, a number of us uh, already were talking about what does this mean going forward? Uh, what does this mean in terms of our next, you know, very large event, July 4th, uh, where we have some 800,000 people uh, in the Boston area? Um, uh, so we are already looking forward, as even as we're also looking back. I, I commend. Uh, this committee. I commend uh, the media for all the attention. We can, we can certainly hope uh, that, uh, that one of the lessons our communities have learned uh, by watching this, you know, 24 7 and living through this, watching it on television, um, is that the, we, we need the community's participation. I hope, that, uh, I hope that message is out there now that, and others have talked about it here today, uh, the, the importance of the, uh, of the public picking up those warning signs, uh, see something, say something. Um, I know that at the local and regional state levels in Massachusetts, uh, we are already looking to increase our engagement uh, with a number of communities, including our local Muslim communities. There already was a, 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 a good program in place, but we need to do better. Um, we are looking forward, as I said, to July 4th. Um, uh, we have, uh, in a collaboration uh, between city and state, um, we have reached out and engaged a number of uh, security experts around uh, the country um, so that we can take new looks at prevention, protection uh, going forward. Um, the, the good news story here was the response, the recovery. Yeah. We need to focus more on yeah. prevention and protection. We will. And again, thank you for that. My time has expired. If I could just end with this. Again, there were many things done right, but there were some meaningful failures. And please, let's not wait for an investigation to complete six months ago to do what we can now to implement some changes that would make this more difficult. Uh, thank you again to the, to the witnesses. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Barber, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the witnesses. Um, really exceptional testimony here today. And you know, many questions have been raised by my colleagues about what we can do to prevent a reoccurrence, and we have to answer, ask and answer those questions, and I know that we'll be having subsequent hearings to examine those issues. What I want to focus on today um, is what happened uh, the day of the bombing and then the weeks uh, or the days following um, because I think we can learn a lot as the gentleman uh, just asked 
uh, about what we can do better, and certainly we can need to expedite those, uh, that, those, that information. I just want to commend uh, both Commissioner uh, Davis and Under Secretary Schwartz for an incredible response, an efficient and effective response to this great tragedy. Uh, and um, I, I do know that uh, other communities, including my own, have faced uh, uh, similar situations, not exactly a bombing in the case of Tucson, but certainly uh, similar in terms of what was required to respond effectively. And I also want to thank you, Commissioner Davis, for bringing the photographs. You know, when we get into discussion about a tragedy like this, we, t we sometimes actually forget that there's a very personal human tragedy that comes out of this. I know that the people in Tucson are still grieving the loss of their loved ones, uh, and many people from that shooting are still dealing with the, the, the change in their lives. So I really appreciate seeing the faces of the good people that were lost that day. It reminds us why our work is so important. Um, and, you know, I remember seeing photographs of the six people who died in Tucson. When you put those photographs up, it took me back to that, that terrible day and the subsequent uh, weeks. I was in Boston last weekend um, for Congressman Gifford's award, and uh, I saw the memorial uh, near the, the finish line. And I saw everywhere I went, signs on buses and everywhere else, Boston Strong. And what I felt and saw in Boston was exactly what I felt and saw in Tucson. We will not be defined by these kinds of tragedies. We will be defined by how we respond. And I, I commend you and all the other uh, good people in Boston and in, in the state for that. I, I want to ask a couple of questions um, about where we are today. And I want to first, uh, uh, first of all, thank um, Senator Lieberman for coming, and, and I want to ask this question of you, uh, Senator. Uh, in your testimony, you pointed out that a holistic approach is the most effective way to solve uh, or to uh, deal with the spread of violent Islamic extremism and the radicalization process that is going on right now, as we've heard, in our country. And I firmly believe that law enforcement, in addition to all of the citizens of our community, are really critical to that effort. Uh, Senator, I, as you know, before you, you left the Senate, we were dealing with the sequestration issue. And I'd like to ask your opinion about how you believe sequestration has impacted uh, on our efforts to both prevent as well as to respond to a, a tragedy like this uh, in the future. I'm particularly interested in what parts of the Department of Homeland Security or, at that matter, any other budget or federal agency you would give priority to as we're trying to figure out how to deal with sequestration. We've given the Department of Homeland Security some flexibility, and they're going to come back to us with reprogramming requests. What would you prioritize in light of what happened in Boston and what we know, unfortunately, may well happen again? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Congressman. Uh, not an easy question because uh, uh, a lot of the programs that are now being funded and cut back a little bit are critically important, such as the programs to aid state and local law enforcement. But if you look at the record of the 12 years now since 9-11, which I recited briefly at the beginning, the only three, I say only, but three, the only attacks, attempted attacks against us that have succeeded were all carried out by homegrown terrorists. And those are the toughest cases. Uh, and there's where you require really the whole of society that I talked about. And that requires, uh, in my opinion, not just FBI, but particularly state and local law enforcement outreaching to the community, engaging the community, particularly in this case, the Muslim American community. This is, in a sense, unconventional. But a lot of the communities that we're going to be asked to do this are as strapped or more strapped for funds in the federal government. And so uh, if, if we want to go where the pro problem seems to be most serious right now, this ideology of violent Islamist extremism uh, among homegrown radicals, I'd say that we, we don't want to cut back in our support of state and local law enforcement because they're, 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 they're where it is. Mr. Chairman, if I may, on a point of personal privilege, this congressman, after the tragedy we had in Connecticut in Newtown, um, called me in a very private call, just to, from, based on his, the pain he went through in Arizona. It was, it was, a, it was a really a, a, a noble and selfless thing. It was uh, and, until I just, I'm about to shoot off my mouth. 
It was a totally private act, which nobody ever would have known about. But I can't, I'm glad to have this opportunity publicly to thank you for that. It meant a lot to me. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back. Thank you, Senator. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of a founding member of this committee, Congressman Shays from Connecticut. Congressman Chris Shays was a former colleague of Senator Lieberman. Chris, we miss you. <laughs> okay. The uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. G gentlemen, thank you very much for your service in this regard in this incident, and of course, to your service to the, your community and your country. With that, my my questions primarily will be to uh, Senator Lieberman and, and uh, Professor Southers, uh, and I know some of it's been covered a little bit by, by the acting chairman at this point, but I can't help but just reiterate some names to you. Uh, Richard Reed, Jose Padilla, Iman Ferris, the Virginia Jihad Network, Assam Hamoud, the Lackawanna Six, the Fort Dix Six Blotters, Nidal Hassan, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and Mohammed Atta. Now, Senator Lieberman, in your opening statement and subsequent questions, I, I think the American people would agree with you, and, and I think that you get it, so to speak. But I'm, for the professor in particular, I, just, I think those names are probably familiar to you. What would you say they have in common? I would say, obviously, they have in common uh, their religion and in a, if you will, extremist Muslim ideology. Okay, thank you. And that's my concern. You know, in the 5th century BC, Sun Tzu said, know thy enemy and know thyself. And as a military officer, of course, it served me well. Uh, and based on research, at least 50 publicly known radical Islamist inspired terror plots targeting the United States, States have been foiled since 9-11. And did, any, did you know, uh, Professor, that 30 of the FBI's 31 most wanted terrorists are radical Islamists? As a number, no, I did not. Okay, so uh, my concern, is, among other things, is that you're a professor, and, you're, and, and, and I listened to your testimony, and it seems like there is a reluctance to acknowledge what are, who the face and who our enemy is by name. And maybe we're having a, a definitional problem here, but, you know, and let me read the, uh, the president's recent statement. The president stated that the dangers to our homeland now come from self radicalized individuals who, because of whatever warped, twisted ideas they may have, may decide to carry out an attack. Where do you suppose these ideas come from, Professor? Uh, they could come from a variety of extremist ideologies, and your facts are correct. Uh, there have been a number of individuals indicted since 9-11, specifically 207 individuals have been indicted since 9-11 in the United States that have, as you've mentioned, if we will, an Al-Qaeda ideology. Uh, Five percent of those people for roles in violent incidents. There have been 139 right-wing militants indicted since 9-11, where just under 50 percent of those people were engaged in violent attacks before arrest. So my point and my testimony was one of, although the facts are correct with regards to the extremist ideology they share, that we understand that radicalization uh, is not monopolized by any particular ideology or religion or race. But or by and large, would you agree that the greatest propensity by far is the radical Islam, not any other one, just that one? I, I would agree that based on the facts we have today, absolutely, those who, that would support Okay, that. so with that, Senator Lieberman, the YouTube account under Tamerlan's, by the way, and his, his name is The Sword of Islam, showed that he had viewed multiple Russian language videos on radical Islam and even compiled playlists of jihadi videos. Should we and should the authorities have been concerned? Well, of course, <clears throat> and part of uh, your investigation and the executive branch investigation has to be, why weren't they? Why didn't they? Did they know that? I, I'm afraid that they didn't know that uh, Tamerlan had put up his own um, a YouTube channel and, and was broadcasting all those uh, violent Islamist extremist uh, uh, videos. But uh, obviously that, that's one of the places uh, where the system broke down. So let me ask you this question, Senator. Why do you think, I know you can't answer for him, but why do you think this administration is unwilling to use the term radical Islam to describe these acts of terror? And, and this is really important because investigations and in our national mood about how we deal with this, I think, is expressed here. What is gained by the, president, the president's refusal to appropriately describe jihad as expressed by radical Islamist extremists as their motivation for attacking the United States and other free nations? 
Well, I, I, I don't know. In other words, uh, th this is a debate that I had um, over the years during my time in the Senate, and particularly with this administration. Um, for all the reasons you say, you've got you to know your enemy and call it what it is, particularly now. Uh, there's a danger if you think that the enemy is al-Qaeda and you observe that bin Laden is killed and uh, al central al-Qaeda is on the run, you may be lured into believing that the war is over. But there is this ideology, violent Islamist extremism, which in fact is not over, it's spreading. And it's not just spreading to enough people here to make us worry at home, but it's what's happening in Syria and Mali and Yemen and you just in Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and Chechnya and Dagestan. And America. So, uh, uh, and and uh, in America. So uh, I, I don't get it. I, I presume it's because of a sensitivity that if you use the term Islam or Muslim at all with relationship to violence or extremism or terrorism, it will do offense to Muslims. But I know I, I'm privileged to know a lot of my fellow Americans who are Muslim. They're law-abiding. They're patriotic. They have nothing to do with Absolutely. these criminals and terrorists and uh, I don't think we it's it's fair to them I don't think it's fair to them not to single these people out we, we maybe the words we're using are not right but you know somebody else said this I'll just repeat it it's it, it's it's too short and too simple but unfortunately it, it does bear some truth which is that obviously most Muslims are not terrorists but the sad fact is today that most terrorists that we're dealing with in America are inspired by this violent Islamic extremist ideology. And you've got to recognize that to deal with it. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. I recognize my friend from New Jersey, Mr. Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me first start out with uh, thanking uh, Commissioner Davis and Under Secretary Schwartz for the incredible job that was done in Boston uh, by your organizations, along with the federal government. Uh, it, it truly shows that the system works and that uh, we have the capability uh, to, when an event occurs, uh, finalize it very quickly. I think it's extraordinary that this whole incident was wrapped up in a week. It's, it's absolutely uh, uh, incredible uh, in my view. I thought this would be a situation that would drag on for quite some time, but to have an incident happen at the beginning of the week and to have it completed and, and the bad guys found in a week, I think says a lot about the system that we have in place. Uh, there were naturally some issues, um, and they've been exhausted here today, I think. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to, um, like to ask um, uh, Commissioner Davis, um, you know, the administration has proposed to consolidate the Homeland Security grant programs, including UASI, the State Homeland Security grant program, into one funding pool. Under the proposal, it is unclear whether grantees would be required to dedicate 25% of the grant awards to law enforcement, terrorism, and terrorism prevention activities. Uh, based on um, the way you've been able to utilize those resources, do you have concerns about the proposed grant consolidation? I certainly owe a debt of gratitude to President Obama and to Secretary Napolitano, but I, I have to uh, uh, I have to say that I think that that, that plan is uh, is going to be detrimental to the further security of our city. I, I, I have to uh, I have to say that the UASI program has been extremely helpful and made a difference, and I think it should continue as it is. Yes, I we've had great experience with that um, in Northern Jersey, where I come from, Newark, New Jersey, which has major airport and port and chemical installations that the UASI grant has been instrumental in us being able to do um, the types of things we need to do in order to make sure that uh, that area is safe. So with your concern, I'm very concerned as well. Um, the other thing that I have, um, since joining the committee, have um, um, gotten involved in is the whole question around interoperability. And um, you know the response efforts 
you know, following the bombing demonstrated successes in interoperability between agencies, disciplines, and jurisdictions. You know, the Commonwealth received, as you well know, $3.11 million from the Interoperable Emergency Communications Grant between uh, FY08 and FY10. The last year, that program received allocated funding. How did these funds from the grant help contribute to your interoperability? Well, thank you for the question. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, interoperability has been a huge success story in Massachusetts and was a, a great story on April 15th and the days that followed. Um, through a variety of grant funds, some you mentioned, uh, there was the PSIC money that came to the Commonwealth as well. Um, a number of years ago, we uh, created a statewide interoperability executive committee um, that took control of and charge over all of the Homeland Security funds that came into the Commonwealth. Um, uh, and that group, which is comprised of uh, people from all over the state, uh, developed local, regional, and statewide interoperability plans, um, and then invested in those plans. Um, so if you fast forward over the last number of years to where we were on April 15th, um, an hour before the bombing, as we were supporting the Boston Marathon, um, there were public safety agencies, local, state, and federal, across eight cities and towns that were all communicating. Um, tactical units were on their own channels. Command level people were on their own channels. Uh, voice communication was working. Um, uh, and that remained true through the week. But perhaps more importantly, um, if this were to happen or a similar type no-notice event happens tomorrow, um, we have the capability across the state by just flipping, you know, pushing buttons and flipping s switches to make sure that uh, that level of interoperability um, is established. And uh, I think it's fair to say that none of this would have happened without the Homeland Security grant streams that have been coming into the Commonwealth. I mean, I just add that uh, there's one uh, fly in the ointment here, uh, which is the T-band. And, and I know we're getting into sort of complicated things that I might not be the best person to explain, but if we lose T-band, as is scheduled to happen in the next six or seven years, according to the FCC rules, uh, virtually every police department in the metropolitan area of Boston from 495 in will be adversely affected by that. We need to revisit that, and we need to talk about these new technologies that are out there that will help us with interoperability. This has all been put together with uh, funding that has that worked for us, but but because of the, some of the broadband uh, issues that, that are being discussed right now and the T-band that we are scheduled to lose, we're going to have problems. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is acting chairman. I'm trying to promote acting chairman. Uh, you know, we need to be cognizant of these type of issues moving forward. Uh, we see how well it worked um, in Boston, and to cut that funding, I think, would be detrimental to this nation's security moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with the gentleman, and obviously, Northern New Jersey and New York are really one one unit. So, thank you. Uh, before I close the hearing, I just have several questions for Senator Lieben and Commissioner Davis. I guess under the heading of lessons learned and going forward. Uh, Senator Lieberman, uh, when the FBI did its investigation of the, uh, the, based on the tip from the Russians uh, to determine whether or not the older brother was radicalized, uh, they did not discuss it with the imam or anyone in the mosque. My understanding is that's because of a change in DOJ guidelines in the last several years that to go to a mosque they have to get approval from a committee in Washington, I believe. Do you think, in view of the fact that if a person is going to be radicalized as a Muslim, you should go to his house of worship to see whether or not the people in that community would have felt that he had been radicalized? I, I do. Um, I, I don't know exactly what happened here, but th this is why I raised the question about the uh, Department of Justice guidelines for the FBI, uh, because, again, looking back, unusual to get this kind of tip from Russian intelligence. What was the nature of the investigation that the FBI did. It sounds to me like they, but we don't know. So you'll ask them. They talked to Tamerlan Chernayev, they talked to his mother, they had some a sporadic surveillance around his house. But as far as I can tell, they, they didn't talk to anybody else. And 
um, you know, talk about the whole of society. If you really wanted to check somebody out before you close the file, which is what they did, um, you have to talk to friends, neighbors, and people in their house of worship. And, and that's not, to me, that's not a violation of, you know, the right freedom of religion or anything else. It's, it's putting first the safety of the people of Boston in this case, including everybody who was a member of the mosque. Yeah. Well, so, Senator, this is an issue that maybe affects the House more than the Senate, but I think the last count there was anywhere between 85 and 100 committees and subcommittees and commissions that claim some jurisdiction over homeland security. Do you think, in view of the problems that we, that we saw or encountered over, you know, in this particular case, as far as maybe one agency not knowing what the other is doing, that the time has come to consolidate, further consolidate within Congress? jurisdiction over Homeland Security rather than having it spread over so many different committees and subcommittees? Well, I sure hope so. I mean, it's great to be back with you, Congressman King. We work so closely together, and we always will on these matters. And you remember, after 9-11, after the 9-11 Commission report, uh, the Kane hamilton report, amazingly, we worked together across party lines, both chambers mm -hmm. of White House. We got most of their recommendations adopted, in, at least in part, except one the one that reformed Congress and limited the number of committees having oversight of Homeland Security because that was Congress protecting its own turf. And so what's the significance of that? First off, it, it takes time from the Department of Homeland Security that they really ought to be spending back at the office protecting our Homeland Security. It also um, makes the work of Congress less effective in combating uh, the threats to our security. So I, I hope that one of the things that may come out, um, this is probably a, a quixotic hope, <laughs> but is that uh, come out of the tragedy in Boston is that the Congress, again, take a look at itself, not just the administrative uh, branch of our government, and figure out how we can better organize uh, to deal with uh, uh, homeland defense. Thank you, Senator. I have a question for Commissioner Davis. You said that the mechanisms are in place for the FBI to notify you when there's a threat. Do you think we should consider lowering the threshold as to what a threat is? For instance, when they were told by the Russians to look into the older brother, uh, if that should happen in the future, wouldn't it make sense to speak to the local police department to see whether or not they know anything on him and perhaps ask the local police to keep an eye on him as they go forward? That certainly is an area that, that deserves very close scrutiny, uh, Congressman. I, I believe that uh, our, our relationship has improved dramatically in the last 10 years. But when you're dealing with intelligence between nations, um, that's still difficult to, to access. Um, and, and there are reasons for that, and I understand them. But when information is out there that affects the safety of my community, I need to know that. Thank you, Commissioner. And even if, you know, they wouldn't have to tell you it even came from the Russians. They could just say, we received a tip from someone that perhaps he's been radicalized. Could you keep an eye on him? Right. And, and I've, I've received secret and top secret information in the last mm -hmm. 10 years. But, um, but, I, but, I, but I think that where that, where that sort of bar is that, that everybody gets mm -hmm. notified on, um, that, that has to be looked at as to whether it's in the right place. I think after this attack, a point was made, there was no chatter, there was no international intelligence coming. And I think that's going to be the wave of the future. These are going to be attacks that are under the radar screen, and it's more important than ever the local police be involved, because no one has a better feel for the community than the local police. And, and we have 600,000 people in local right. police departments across the nation, which is a force multiplier for the federal agencies. Right. Thank you. Well, let me uh, thank all the witnesses. And Professor, I didn't welcome you back. I, I know you testified before the committee five years ago, I guess it was. It's great to have you back. Mr. Schwartz, it's great to have you here. Really added a lot. And Commissioner Davis, uh, the, whole, the whole country is looking at you for the outstanding job that you did. And Senator Liebman, what can I say? An old friend and a real patriot, and uh, one of the few people in politics who never lets you down. So, Senator Liebman, thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all the witnesses for their testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. The hearing record will be held open for 10 days. Let me just on behalf of myself and the entire committee, thank Chairman McCall for holding this hearing, the first one in the Congress on such a vital issue. And with that, without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>